Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. Now for a word from our sponsors. This episode of Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by Fat Snacks. Fat Snacks' mission is to make foods that taste incredible and make a keto or low-carb diet more enjoyable and sustainable. Personally, I'll throw a pack of their chocolate chip cookies in my travel bag when on the road or away from my kitchen. Other options include double chocolate chip, lemony lemon, and peanut butter. Next time someone tells you a keto diet is too restrictive, blow their minds by telling them to head over to fatsnacks.com forward slash HPO. That's F-A-T-S-N-A-X dot C-O-M forward slash H-P-O and type in promo code H-P-O for 5% off their next order. Now back to the show. It's all right. (laughs) (laughs) You said it was 5 a.m. by you? Yep. Yep. Cool. Do you have some training to do afterwards or? Yeah, I might go for a run after, get it done or I might go back for a sleep. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we will, we'll try not to keep you too long so you can get a quick nap in if you need to. Oh no, that's all right. I got all day. <laughs> I know how that goes. I usually get up pretty early for training, but every once in a while, like in the thick of it, I'll wake up, I'll have a cup of coffee and I'll just be like, that didn't do anything. You go back to bed <laughs> for like an hour. <laughs> Congrats on uh, the run. That oh was, yeah. Uh, thanks. Awesome. Yeah. That was a, an exciting day of, uh, still trying to wrap my head around uh, the way I ran it. I've been historically a positive split mostly for hundred milers. And this one was like a two minute negative split from the first 50 to the second 50. So mm. that was kind of a, a new way to do it, but it certainly feels better doing it that way. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. And you, you just pretty much ran like four oh eight or four ten average and yeah. ran the same pace pretty much the whole time. Yeah, I think like I probably had like I had a couple outlier miles on either end. I think my fastest was like just under a 620 mile. Um, so whatever that would be for kilometers. And then I think my slow, I mean, I had a couple slow ones. I took three bathroom breaks total. Uh, mm-hmm. So those ones were kind of artificially slow. Uh, but non bathroom break, my slowest I think was like a 710 or something like that. But most of them were kind of right in that like, like mid. 640 per mile range yeah. but it's kind of it's kind of goofy because the track was actually 443 meters so it wasn't like i got used to doing it on like the a typical 400 meter track where i just knew like i just know like it's 402 and about a half laps total to get to 100 miles and you get used to kind of just hitting within the ranges of those laps and then you have to kind of recalculate it and calibrate a little differently but um yeah. All things considered, it's a pretty cool spot. They have a, it's the Olympic training facility in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So they have like a speed skating rink there. So they, they keep the, the, the building at like, I think normally it's at like 55 degrees. They didn't have ice on the speed skating rink. So I think it may have been a little warmer than that, like 60 at the highest, but pretty much ideal for endurance stuff. Wow. And that was a, was it like a synthetic rubber track? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's always, it's kind of like a, it's a double-edged sword with those things because you, you can certainly go fast on them, but uh, they do chew your feet up pretty good <laughs> being yeah. on that hard of a surface all day. And you just had to run the whole, the same direction all time? They actually switch directions. M- most events will do it every four hours. I've been at one in the past where it was every six, but four is pretty typical for those. Did you switch direction in your training as well? Your mm-hmm. ones where you ran on the track? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I kind of, before this one, my most specific training block for this sort of thing was in 2015. And I even calculated it down to like a third of the time I was going to run 
uh, clockwise and then two thirds counterclockwise. Cause that would be the four, eight split I'd have for a 12 hour. This time I did it a little, I did it pretty close to that, but I wasn't quite as like dialed in, in terms of getting it exactly like that. But I had some direction switches in the training runs and stuff too. So, um, so kind of a goofy, goofy sport, but <laughs> yeah. How about you? The next thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm actually doing a, a race over in Greece in four and a half weeks called the Spartathlon. So uh, a little longer, it's 100, 153 miles. So I can go quite a bit slower, but I'm hoping to be kind of feeling decent by then. Yep. So your oh. legs are still a bit sore. Not too sore, actually. I think uh, the, the soreness, my, my left like foot and ankle is still a little holding on to a little swelling, but everything else is kind of bouncing back all the way. I think it usually takes me about three days just to kind of get the energy back to really want to train. And I think some of that's just like the huge calorie deficit you're going to get. You kind of get caught up on that and then you start to kind of feel alive again. Wow. Wow. Well, um yeah uh i was gonna ask you something i've forgotten now (laughs) um yeah was there any point like where you thought maybe you could have run a faster average pace or like that was pretty much yeah you know it's probably a little bit of hindsight but uh it in the back of my mind i feel like I feel like I can do six forties is a fairly reasonable target. Um, the hard part to really tease out of that is how fast was I actually going because you, once you calculate in the bathroom stops and then the interesting thing about these is usually they're done within the framework of a longer event. So I was in the middle of a 24 and a 48 hour event. So there was probably like, 30, 40 people on the track that are going much longer, so much slower as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, track protocol is the passer goes outside. So I oh, spent really? a wow. decent amount of time on like lanes two and three on the turns. So that would, oh, that's a bit frustrating. Yeah. It, you know, it, it is what it is. I think eventually they'll, we'll get a little more interest and in put together an event where they just have like, you know, a handful of guys all targeting say a hundred miles and then you can just hug the turn the whole way. Uh, it's, I feel like it balanced pretty nicely compared to some of the other events I've done though. Cause usually I can't control weather as nicely as I did at this one. Mm. So that yeah. certainly helped quite a bit relative to other ones. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's probably a few minutes at least there for just having ideal lane one set type of stuff, but yeah, definitely. That's yeah. What I was going to ask you like, so when, how long until you run again after the event? Yeah, normally I, I'll, the way I look at it is I look at kind of in a two week window where I can use as much of that two weeks as I want. It usually ends up happening as about five or six days. I'll start getting some energy back in the land and I'll just do a couple like real short, easy jogs or maybe even hiking or something like that. And then just kind of start gradually testing the waters from there. And usually the thing I pay the most attention to is just like how excited am I to start training again? Cause it can be easy. I'm sure you've seen this before too. Like you'll get a little too excited early and get into the training block and you get three, four weeks in and you're like, why didn't I take an extra week off? <laughs> and then it's too late. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I'm, I'm actually, I do uh, one of my sponsors, ultra footwear. Uh, I do some event stuff with them as well. So I'm going to do a group run tonight, but that'll be a pretty leisurely, like probably three miles on the trails. So that'll kind of be my, my test to see where I'm at more or less and then decide from there kind of what direction to head. Yeah. Are they really super light? The, that ultra that you ran in, is it a really light shoe? Yeah. It's the the ultra solstice. So it's, it's not quite a true racing flat, but it's pretty close to that. I would, I would call it like an aggressive trainer more or less, or like maybe like a speed work shoe or something along those lines. They were, they make a lighter one called the vanish that I really like that's that's a true racing flat but um it's a little narrower of a build so my thought was like i want a little more space in the shoe for just how long i was going to be out there and the solstice kind of has that so that's kind of why i went with that one yeah fair enough yeah and you didn't change shoes and socks at any point 
No. Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. I've actually never done that, uh, that I can remember. So I know and it's pretty common, you know, especially in the trail running stuff, cause you, know, you get wet and then run it up and downhill and rocks and stuff like that. It gets yeah. a little more needed, I think, but, uh, I never felt like it was worth wasting the time to switch shoes. I usually bring a backup pair and just in case, but the plan is to avoid that if I can. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the shoes are an interesting, really interesting bit of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When I've you been running to... in zero zeros. Yep. Mm -hmm. But only for training. And then in races, I've chucked on the Nike, um, 4%, one of those. Uh huh. And it's a totally different way of running, uh -huh. but I haven't yet found a shoe that sort of fulfills that taking the shock of running when your legs are tired and you're running on paved surfaces Yeah, and combining it with like a lightweight shoe. So I think there's a Reebok that I really want to try. Like it's a, a, a true racing flat. Uh -huh. um, so I want to try and find one of those and, but they're pretty rare to try and hunt down. Um, so <laughs> Yeah, I want to find that balance between yeah a super lightweight shoe with that really good foam, mm -hmm. but also one that's not going to squish my foot too badly. But for for twenty one k or so, like you can kind of get away with being a bit squished if it's got other trade offs. Yeah, um, but yeah, but the Nike's good, but it's not it's not amazing when you're running when you're used to running in a zero drop zero support shoe. Mm -hmm. It's quite a change. Yeah. Yeah, it is. You, and I always think like that, it, I think the, a lot of people, they, they don't necessarily recognize their foot muscles as being like any other muscle in the body. So like I always tell people like, if you're going to, you know, go down in, in cushion or go to more of a low profile shoe, then, you know, think of it like going into the gym and adding something to your workout. Like if you're sore the next day, you probably shouldn't go back and do that same thing. And usually when people kind of pay attention to their body. They can navigate those waters, but it is worth paying attention to. Yeah. Yeah. It took me quite a long time to actually get really comfortable in the zeros. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, but once I got comfortable, then it's like no looking back. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Once you get that foot strength, then it's like, you kind of want to keep it. <laughs> yeah. Although the zero has, it's like a pretty thin, it's pretty thin sole. Uh huh. And, um, at times I'm like on the, some of the trails and hitting rocks in the wrong spot. And I'm a bit like, Oh, this is a little bit like not great for my foot. So yeah, I don't know. I might have to just look at an outro cause I know they have a, a slightly more cushion sole, don't they? Yeah, they do. They also, they have a few more, like, cause I kind of have that same situation out here in Phoenix. When I get on the trails, there's so much like hard rocky surfaces so I still kind of like that firm feeling under my foot, but like you said, it's no fun getting stabbed in the foot with a sharp rock. So mm. usually what I'll do is I'll get a shoe that's kind of got a firm midsole, but a decent thickness to it. And that usually solves the problem pretty, pretty well. And uh, they have, they've got a model now called the duo that tries to balance a little bit of the lightness in the cushion that I actually used for the San Diego hundred earlier this year it's a road shoe, but it works well enough on the trails and it kind of had the, the combo I was looking for of the protection, but the lightness. So I didn't want to go out there with like bricks on my feet after typically yeah. racing in kind of a low profile light shoe. And that seemed to work all right. But yeah, if you're ever interested in checking out ultra, let me know. I can get you sent some and, and play around with them if you want. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I feel like I've, I haven't committed anything to zero, but they've sent me shoes. So it's sort uh -huh. of like, you know, you, you haven't committed to anything, but then you still feel obligated. So um, we'll see. But they, I've always told them, like, if anything else came along and I was going to try it, hence running, mm -hmm. racing in Nike, like, you know, they're fine if I'm run, racing in a Nike and just doing some training in there. So sure, I, mm -hmm. I could definitely train. I could definitely test out anything else and um, not feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm not breaking any contracts. That's for right. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is interesting because there's just so many options now and you can, you can almost geek out too much on any one aspect of the sport and then, <laughs> and then you find yourself just always looking at all the little tiny details. I just sent Sean a message. He might, <laughs> pretty sure I sent him the link on that thread with us. I can double check though. So are you training for something right now or? 
Yeah, there's always a few races coming up. Um, and actually got a 70.3 in uh, just over a week. And then another one a week after that. So we're coming into like a pretty, you know, into our sort of summer heading into the racing season a bit. So yeah, I got a few races coming up. Cool. What's your, what's your favorite distance for triathlon? Um, Ironman is the favorite, like, I don't know. It's something about the commitment in training and the race and everything that you just take everything to that next level. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy it more when I'm taking it all to that next level, the, the greater focus and commitment and everything. So, but I haven't done one of those in a couple of years now. So um, hopefully I can get back to those next year and just do basically one or two a year, um, you know, at a high level, but yeah. And running a marathon, like, you know, I really want to run some fast marathon splits again. So mm -hmm. that's where I want to get back to, you know, you can run a half, a good half, but it's got nothing. It's nothing like running a good, Ironman marathon. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Ironman is interesting to me. I've never done one. And some of that's just because I'm absolutely horrific at swimming. <laughs> I think I could figure out the biking. The swimming would take a lot of work. And I think, I mean, so much of it's technique as I'm sure, you know, but like, mm. uh, yeah, it, it's an interesting, I think it's interesting just because like for me training for these races, like I, I get to the point where even if I'm doing a really aggressive volume buildup, there's a point where like physically you kind of need to hit the reset button and, and recover. Whereas I would guess for you, you always have kind of that option of like, well, my, my, the impact is a little too much for me right now, but I could still hop in the pool, but then you, you can burn yourself out if you do too much. So. Yeah. I think that's why you can kind of hit it pretty hard for a couple of months and, mm -hmm. um, for an Ironman build-up, yeah, you just kind of a couple of months solid and just do the kilometers and, and you can balance it out pretty well. And like you would do, say I, I in riding, like not a lot of intensity, mm -hmm. but then you get a bit of intensity in the pool. Um, and then in running, you can kind of a little bit of intensity, but generally these days I'm sticking to math and mm. just doing it all that way. Um, so you can kind of get quite a lot of kilometers and hours in because a lot of it's yeah on the bike. That's no impact, but just, just time. Mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of eat and support yourself throughout. So. Yeah. Well, what does a, a peak week look like for you from a time standpoint? Like how many hours do you put in? Um, well, it varies a lot compared mm -hmm. to like uh, this year, it's not been that big. Um, yeah, not that big at all. So <laughs> this year, it's probably only been about 15 hours or something lately. Um, yeah, hardly any at all. And then I'm having some, still having some like weeks of like not a lot because I'm still been mucking about and fatigue coming and going still and still, still dialing in the diet with a few little tweaks here and there to, um, yeah, figure it all out. Still figuring it all out. <laughs> yeah. Have you always done kind of a, like a, a math maximum function training type of style or? Um, yeah. When I was, when I was back in like around 2012, um, I was always training on my own. So I think just through virtue, I was doing a lot of it at like a, that good level on the bike. So all my bike riding was pretty much at math and, but running, I was chucking in intervals um, and then swimming, I was swimming on my own. So it was fairly like, it was decent but it wasn't like trying to kill myself. So mm -hmm. I was without knowing about, I didn't even know about math back then. So it was just sort of training myself and that's what worked. Um, but yeah, but since then, now I'm doing pretty much everything at math and at least for swimming and running. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, the benefits are there and come race day, it's the, the benefits are showing. Like even though I'm going nowhere near that effort in training, in races, like I'm still able to get up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I found it, find it really interesting. Cause I, I'd be curious kind of how, how you look at this with Ironman because it's, you know, it's essentially like an ultra and that how long it takes to finish it. Um, but like, for me, I look at like a periodization kind of similar to what I would at even a shorter endurance event, but I kind of operate under the, the philosophy of like, the things that are more specific to race pace and race environment need to be closer to the race 
and the things least specific to it should be further from it. So like you think of like a 5k training program, you're going to be doing some of those shorter interval sessions closer to the race. Uh, whereas for like a hundred miler, I might do some of that, like VO two max type things earlier on, but then I get further and further away from it as I get closer to the race. But this last training block I did, I didn't have as much time between my kind of trail season and, and this specific event I did last weekend. So I basically just passed on all the like early stuff, like the VO two max short interval sessions and went straight into more or less a maximum aerobic function training plan. And and then ultimately kind of settled in at like right around hundred mile intensity and just loaded up a ton of volume around there. They're maybe a little faster, a little more intense, but, and then in a few kind of threshold workouts here and there when I felt really good, but uh, that seemed to work really well. It, It really kind of normalized things. I think where I never really felt like I was like uncomfortable with, with the, the pace out there at the race. So I really do like that kind of framework. And I, I typically have a pretty good foundation in that before I even jump into the specifics of a training plan too. So uh, it's kind of a cool philosophy. It depends what you class as VO2 max. It's a very big um, spectrum of what someone might do in an effort. Like (laughs) someone Mm -hmm. might totally overdo it, or you can just do like, I was listening to one the other day that they recommending just two 20 second max efforts. Mm. Um, on that uh, Carol bike. Have you heard of that? Oh, yeah. Like a, mm-hmm. So I was listening to that and going, yeah, I can see how that would work. Just two 20 seconds, two, three times a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and that counts as a VO2 max session. So that's interesting. Yeah, I've always, my thought has always been like, it depends, I guess it depends on how you look at it. But uh, like my goal, I guess, with VO2 max has always been trying to establish volume at that intensity and kind of gradually building it. So I've always been kind of a fan of the two to four minute range. Usually I end up settling at about three just because it's right in the middle where it's kind of like just long enough where you're not taking too much out of you, or I mean, just short enough, you're not taking too much out of any one interval session. So you can kind of maximize the number of them you do, but not so short that it takes too long to get into it. Um, and I, that I, I have seen some stuff on some of those shorter sessions though. I think they would be uh, kind of an interesting thing to, to explore a bit. Yeah. So you would never chuck in like, you know, even 10 second sprints or something. Um, you know, I used to do it a lot more. I used to do a workout where I would do essentially like a 20 second more, more or less a 20 second, like build up all out and then kind of coast down. So it was like, it was 20 seconds with maybe eight to 12 of those being kind of full sprint. And then I would do a 40 second jog. So it was like a minute each one. And then I just repeat. Uh, I haven't done as much of that recently, but it might be fun to explore it again, just to, if for nothing else, just to add a little bit of more flavor to, <laughs> to the training. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah. Interesting. I think to try and do all this longer stuff and, low carb diet and then try and go out and do the sprints and just see, see what's happening a little bit, see the changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, how maybe we we should chat about that a little bit. Well, how have you, you kind of structured your diet historically? Um, Historically I was trying to eat clean and basically eating the same things every day, like which would have been like rice, tuna, nuts and a bit of greens and so when i was training for kona around 2012 it was the same food like kind of every day so i think that helped um but then a few years ago changed to like um i cut out grains and i cut out meat with feet because i kind of just got led down the rabbit led down by people saying well this worked for me so you should cut out meat um and that did that for maybe a year and and then i went keto and reintroduced meat um like i was still eating fish and eggs so then i've kind of reintroduced meat gone keto still not getting like great consistency and then this year pretty much the end of towards the end of last year started to really lower my fiber and then yeah just transitioning into carnivore at the start of this year and um but then i was still having little bits and pieces and like maybe just like a bit of decaf coffee and things but now i'm like 
no coffee, no plants of any sort. But I've still had some trouble with, um, I think I've realized that there's histamine still a problem mm. for me. So I think I'm going to have probably something like mast cell activation syndrome or basically just my cells are pretty screwed mm -hmm. and the histamine has improved things. So eating low histamine foods. Um, but then even now, like if I chuck in a supplement, maybe I'm testing out things and supplements and I'll be like, Oh no, I'm still getting like a bit of fatigue back from having um, some supplements or if I've overdone um, even eggs, like I'm not sure. Cause obviously eggs, the egg whites can be a bit of a reaction with histamine. So mm. I'm still trying to fine tune it cause I'll be like really good and be going better than I have in years. But then I like, there'll be something changed and I'm, and I'm trying to track down, Oh, what did I change? Cause it's not always obvious yeah. what changed. And like with the histamine thing, that was like really messing me up. Cause I thought I was eating really well, mm -hmm. but then whenever I was eating aged meat or bone broth or things like that, you know, that was, that was screwing me up and I could, didn't even realize cause I thought I was eating what was super healthy for me. So that's only been in the last like month that I've realized that, Oh, hang on. The histamine foods have been messing me up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really interesting. And it, you know, it, it is almost something at this point, I think you kind of have to just say, okay, I'm going to figure this out for me personally and semi ignore what's supposedly supposed to work, <laughs> but also yeah. kind of le at least keep a little bit of a, an ear open to kind of like, what other folks are doing or what's working for other people too. But ultimately you got to kind of find that grouping of foods that really, really hum well for you. And, you know, it my, my, I haven't had anything quite maybe as bad as what you did, but uh, when I kind of switched to a high fat, low carb diet, some of those signs were kind of showing up, not necessarily in training yet, but like my sleep was pretty rotten and, uh, historically I'd been really good at that. So that was kind of a red flag. And then, I mean, you know, the energy swings you get when you're on that high carb cycle, they're just like too, we're becoming pretty tough to deal with. But, um, a lot of that cleared up with the keto and then it was like just fine tuning it to lifestyle. And I'd be curious to kind of hear how you structured your keto when you were doing that, if you were doing like a strict kind of classical keto where you kept it under like say 30 to 50 grams a day, or if you were, accommodating a bit for your more active lifestyle. Cause what I, when I got into it, I did kind of a hard reset where I went strict keto for a while, but ultimately I found that like essentially when you're putting in the huge blocks of work, you're kind of working from a little bit of a different, like a different paradigm more or less with the amount of energy you're expending and bringing back a little bit of the carbohydrates, but still staying like very well within the framework of high fat, moderate protein that seemed to work really well doing some of those higher intensity, bigger volume blocks. But, uh, yeah. Did you, did you notice any of that? Um, yes and no. Like when coming from like a fatigue inflammation, like autoimmune kind of reaction where when you're tired, your brain's not really working and you, and you just crave anything like mm -hmm. thinking that anything is going to give you energy. So I didn't really notice that, I was having um, that big of a difference because when I felt fatigued, I would still feel fatigued whether I'd eaten, you know, a million calories and it was all carb or whether I'd eaten like nothing, it wouldn't change my energy levels because the energy level was fatigue related and more cells and energy related rather mm -hmm. than like fuel related. So I haven't ever actually been, I guess, consistent enough, in energy training and things to be like, Oh, this is what I was doing. And this is what was working with this sort of macros. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't been able to break it down to a point of more calories makes me feel better because if my body's had a bit of an inflammatory reaction, then it's just so hard to kind of, it's, it's not because of calories. It doesn't matter what I eat. It's uh -huh. not going to make me feel better. So I'm still mucking about with exactly what macros are going to work well. And, um, and then, like I said, it hasn't been that long since I cut out the plants a hundred percent out. And then even since then it's the histamine has been still throwing me, you know, off the track a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. so it's yeah. Still pretty tough. 
Yeah, the plants and the fiber are interesting things to me because I think it's like when I first started a higher fat approach, it was like, oh, these non-starchy vegetables are an awesome vehicle to get fat in and they don't really move the needle on carb intake. So, you know, seeding like plates full of non-starchy vegetables and putting like the olive oil or the fatty cuts of meat and stuff on it. And it was like, there you go. But, um, you know, after a while doing that, it's like, it's just like the digestion (laughs) is, uh, and I know some of it may is just because like, like I was saying before, you know, you're really active and you have to match that energy output. If you increase everything you're eating, it's just makes sense that you're going to have more to digest. But eventually I got to the point where it was like, I'm going to minimize fiber as much as possible because, you know, then I'm getting, I'm getting the energy source in, but not the bulk because I didn't really want the bulk anymore. And uh, that kind of led me a little closer to animal-based product side of things. And that's been the, one of the biggest things I've noticed. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not like strict carnivore or anything like Sean, but uh, I do have a pretty big foundation in like meat, eggs, dairy, and that sort of thing. And then I'll sprinkle in some, some other stuff here and there, depending on where I'm in training. But uh, the digestion is probably the biggest thing I've noticed. Uh, it's hard to tease out some of this stuff, as you know, but like, I think recovery is pretty I have never recovered as fast. So whether that's an adaptation or if it's the, the diet or whatever else, it seems to be at least heading in the right direction from that, from that standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is interesting. Yeah. When you start mucking about and trying to figure out what do you feel better? Cause there's so many variables in everything. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't kind of do the same thing day after day. Training's different. Sleep's different. Um, what your body might be doing to recover is different. And so it's hard to kind of go, well, this is how many calories I needed yesterday. So I'll eat that many today and I'll feel the same tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I just find it, it's, it is tough to try and nail down some of that stuff. And then even the foods you're eating ver- is slightly varied as well. Like it's uh-huh. not like it's exactly the same amount of fat to protein ratio. If you're eating eggs one day and then the next day you're eating more meat and so uh-huh. I think it's hard to track exactly what you're eating. Anyway. It is. Yeah. And at a certain point you just get sick of that. So like, you know, you, ideally I think you want to get it to be pretty intuitive at a certain point so you can just enjoy what you're eating and get back to work and not have to sit there and calculate all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, uh, there's something I was going to ask you that you had mentioned that I was curious about, but, um, uh, this is something else, but when you're talking about the eggs, I remember when I first switched to kind of a high fat, low carb approach, I, the first thing I started eating more of was eggs and I had like terrible stomach ache after eating them. If I just kind of cooked them like kind of a runny scramble, but if I would cook them like really or like the surefire way to make it work was to hard boil them. And then it didn't give me any issues at all. And eventually I got to a point where like, as long as I got the whites cooked well enough, I could have runny yolk and then not have any issues from it. But, uh, someone told me once that that was maybe, a like a bile secretion situation because historically when I was high carb, you know, I'm, you're eating all the time. So like the way it was described to me is like your bile is supposed to just kind of build up when you're not eating. And then when you do eat, it just dumps. So if you're eating all the time, it's kind of like causing that bile to release, but it's never full. So then if you switch to a diet that's more inducive to having larger meals with more space between them, your body kind of has to catch up from that standpoint. And they said, maybe that was why I was having a harder time with eggs in the beginning, but it's who knows. <laughs> yeah. But the eggs being cooked, the white being cooked is definitely uh, better for digestion. If you cook the whites, it's always going to be better to cook that bit of protein. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause yeah, it can be, the more inflammatory, one of the inflammatory foods is the egg whites, I guess. Uh-huh. So it's always good to cook them fully if you have any gut issues. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. You know, the other thing I, I'm interested in with maybe this, the community as a whole of triathlon is like, yeah, I think a lot of times when people are looking at just their, and this would be maybe applicable to just non, non-athletes too, but uh, when I watch people that are like, tracking nutrition and trying to follow a specific diet it seems like we get into this framework of like well every 24 hours it resets and then i gotta start from zero calories again and then 
you know, over that course, the next 24 hours, work your way up to whatever you plan on trying to target. Whereas for me, it's always been like, or not always, but more recently, I've been more interested in kind of looking at it as like a three day window where if I have like two really big training days or like back to back long runs on the weekend, and then I'm going to take a rest day or like a super easy day, the third day, I don't really strive to hit match my energy and take on those two big session days. So I run a, a calorie deficit, but then on that rest day, since I don't have, I have more time to eat and less, less training to do. I eat in a pretty decent surplus on that third day. So then at the end of three, I kind of hit equilibrium more or less, but not in the day to day side of things. Is that something you've tried before? Or? Yeah, definitely keep that in mind. I definitely wouldn't limit food just cause it's not a training day. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I definitely feel like those days that you don't train as much, you do have to catch up if you have had big days and, that's just always worked. And I think it's something, maybe it's about getting the metabolism going faster again, um, getting the body out of that kind of um, fight or flight kind of protect itself mode um, from being in a bit of a calorie starvation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that have that big, big bolus on that third day is always something that I've kind of leaned towards doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny because like, you, when I look at some of the training blocks and stuff, you, you have a day on the weekend where you have a big enough training outing, you get back and you're like, well, half the day's gone. I haven't really even dug into any food yet. So it's like, yeah, now well, I got to eat this much in six or seven hours and it's just easier to kind of space out a little more. Now for a word from our sponsors. All right, folks, this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox offers you convenience by delivering your meat right to your door with free shipping. They also offer quality by having options such as 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, heritage breed pork, and free-range chicken. They also offer value with their goal to make clean meat accessible to as many people as possible by partnering with a collective of small farms. They are able to deliver you the best products for less than $6 per meal. They often run promos on their website for subscribers to get things like free pork or free bacon. If you enter promo code HPO at checkout, you can also knock an additional $20 off your first subscription. So head over to butcherbox.com and place your first order. Now back to the show. How you guys How's it going? Hearing? Good. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, my bad, Zach. I, no, I, we've just been chatting. I was. I, I saw when you we saw Carrie cancel. I, I was thinking we were done for the day. So my. Oh, uh, my apologies. <laughs> moved on. No, that's the the tragedy of a busy schedule is is eventually yeah. something gets missed. <laughs> oh, no, cool. Anyway, so Pete, how are you doing? Good, thanks, Sean. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Where Where are you at currently? Um, Noosa, Queensland. Just. 
out an hour and a half north of Brisbane. Okay, we just had uh, who do we have on yesterday? We had uh, uh, Ryan Kelly, right? Oh yeah, Ray Kelly. Ray Kelly, sorry, Ray Kelly, and he's from uh, somewhere in Australia. I can't remember now. I think he was in north of, north of Sydney. He yeah, was north of Sydney. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I grew up in I grew up in I grew up in Sydney, and my parents are still there, and. My mum is currently seeing Dr. Paul Mason. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know Paul. Paul's a good guy. I've met him. Yeah. Really, really good guy. <laughs> yeah. Paul's come on a couple of times. He's wealth of knowledge. Mm. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Really. He, and then he calls me up every now and then. So we just have like a casual, casual relationship, not a doctor patient relationship, but he'll just give me some advice and kind of send me some studies that he's found about, you know, athletes and certain supplements or this or that. And he's, uh, yeah, been a good, big help. Well, good. well, Zach, have you guys been, have you guys been on for a bit recording or anything or no? Yeah. We've just been kind of chatting about stuff in it. I, you know, we should probably introduce Pete though. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Was, okay. Okay. That'd be, that'd be good. Yeah, they go probably ahead. got an idea. They, they know he's a, he's a triathlete at least. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Pete, if you want to just like, uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of your background and, and how you've gotten to where you are now so our listeners know kind of where you're coming from. And then uh, we can start jumping into some more stuff if you want. Um, yeah, well, I kind of been a professional triathlete since, I guess, early 20s. I'm 37 now and always just went towards the long distance stuff, towards Ironman was just always what I loved doing. And I'd had fatigue issues since I was a teenager got tested for everything under the sun, everything kind of came back pretty normal. And I continued to get tested through my whole career because I've always had this fatigue issue coming and going. And then basically learned to manage it. And for whatever reason, my body would hold together. And I got, you know, four top tens in Kona, you know, in 2011, I was second and, and won it in 2012. And in that time frame. I think what helped me get there was that I had a, an accident or an injury like in sort of March, April every year. And I would have six weeks of nothing. And then Hawaii is in October every year. So I would just basically have one kind of steady buildup. So my body wasn't ever burnt out. And I think that allowed my body to have quite a good rest and then perform well. But then once I'd won Kona and uh, turned 30, you know, things started to get a bit, rougher and it went from being like a day or a week of feeling a bit average to being a month or two months and um, sort of muscle imbalances and weaknesses sort of became sort of injuries and everything just got harder and since then I've been trying to find out what it is because like I say every test came back pretty normal except for some parasites in the gut and nothing I did got rid of those and that just became the norm that I was just feeling fatigued, but then I could bounce back and do six good weeks of training and get in pretty good shape and have a good race here and there. So I just kind of kept chipping away, feeling average, but then I'd feel good and be like, no, I can still do this. And then ended up being like, I have to take 2018 off. So no training, no racing and try and figure out what was going on with my body. And I got a lot of headway in that year, last year and figured, yeah, I can come back and start, improving so in that time frame last year end of last year i started realizing and learning about carnivore and about lectins and all those other things that could have been causing me the sort of autoimmune reactions i was having and pretty quickly noticed some good differences and improvements and carried on kind of trying to narrow down my diet more so but it's still an ongoing process um actually because it hasn't been that long since yeah other things have cropped up, whether it been a histamine issue just a month ago, figuring out, oh, I'm still having a reaction to aged meat and aged, you know, bone broths and things like that was pretty frustrating to still be going, going better than I've gone in years and getting back to racing relatively well. But I know I've still got a long way to go, but better than I have been in years, but then still be having these setbacks a little bit here and there. So, you know, I'm still, still figuring it all out, but just learning about carnivore, learning about other chemical processes in the body has been, has been a long journey. And I know like <laughs> I'm only scratching the surface really. Pete, you know, it's, it's very interesting. You don't really associate, you know, 
chronic fatigue or fatigue syndrome with a, with a high performing athlete. I mean, it's like the last thing you think of is like you're fatigued. Why are you an athlete? Maybe the training's making you tired. You know, I mean, that would be kind of like the sort of the, the layman sort of perspective on that. But I mean, it is interesting to have that sort of going on. And, you know, we do see athletes that sometimes do deal with health issues that despite that, they're still able to persevere and train and perform well. And obviously uh, you've done that at a very high level. Um, what has been, you know, what, I mean, what, what has been the advantage, I guess, you know, and you, you, you know, this is a thing that's kind of interesting because, you know, I hear constantly from the, the exercise, you know, sports scientists saying, well, if a, you know, a meat-based diet w- would have worked and everybody would have already tried it and all the athletes would be doing it. And it's kind of interesting because I don't know that that's necessarily true because we see, you know, we, we had Tim Noakes on, oh, I don't know, last year. And we were talking about a guy named Art Shrub who was, uh, you know, this is, this is, again, this is a while back. This is, you know, the turn of the 20th century where he basically held every running world record in the world. And he was basically on a carnivore diet. I mean, he was like, you know, 10 from 10,000 meters to the hundred meter dash. He like owned it. He was the best athlete in the world. And, and so we kind of get, kind of got away from that type of diet. I'm not sure it's been fully investigated. And so it's interesting to see, I mean, Zach is not that Zach is hundred percent carnivore, but Zach is definitely I think it's fair to say, Zach, and correct me along, that you definitely have a meat-based basis of your diet, and then you, you know, you kind of utilize carbohydrates as kind of a, you know, as more of a, a performance thing rather than, uh, you know, your dietary basis. And so we're seeing that uh, uh, a number of athletes now that I've seen, particularly myself included, have seen remarkable improvements by just dramatically up, upping the, the meat content of the diet. So that's very you know, it's kind of an observation I've had that maybe there is a paradigm change coming that we'll see more and more athletes, uh, you know, just kind of test some, some things out, test, test the waters a little bit. Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, even when I took last year off training, the first few months of last year, I would wake up and everything was aching so badly, my knees and ankles particularly. So that inflammation was nothing to do with, you know, training or anything. So it's clear that my body is a thousand times better than it was when I was eating the plants and eating a regular diet. And now it's, you know, way, way, way better, but I've still got little tweaks here and there because I've been having these fatigue issues since, you know, about 20 years now. So I've screwed up my body and all its processes and hormone levels and everything pretty badly in that time frame of training for Ironman certainly didn't aid it. So, you know, it definitely would have made it worse. So, now that um, I've sort of done that damage to my body, I guess, with food, but also with the training and stress, you know, I've got a fairly long comeback period, I think, to get everything else balanced where I can eat food that is my body's just going to react to in a good way. Like the cells are going to start to know, oh, we know what to do with this and we're doing the right thing. And, and going to carnivore has definitely helped that, obviously, because I had metabolic syndrome as well. And now that's cleared up. So my blood sugar levels are really balanced now. And, um, you know, I don't have any um, fluctuations of, you know, fasting blood sugar levels or anything like that. It's really cleared up. So there's been some huge changes in physiology and and what's going on. And, um, but like I mentioned before, even just figuring out, oh, my, my gut is so messed up as well from years of stressing my body that, you know, I only just figured out that histamine could be a problem for me just a few weeks ago. And, you know, so that was something else that was still messing me up occasionally. So it's been a bit, it's still been frustrating, but that's the story of my career is, you know, two steps forward, one step back of it. Um, But we are getting, now that I'm back racing again, it's, I'm getting much, much closer to having a body that, you know, is, is doing what I want it to do every day. Pete, I mean, it's kind of interesting to, to see that someone like yourself, uh, you know, which, I mean, lean, athletic, you know, engaged in lots of sports, develops metabolic syndrome. I mean, we saw that with, you know, there's a famous rower by the name of Stephen Redgrave, who was a five-time Olympian, one of the best Olympic rowers on the planet. And I can tell you that rowing is a tremendously physically demanding sport, undoubtedly like, you know, same thing like the Ironman is. And so, but perhaps somebody like that develop, you know, type 2 diabetes, is just shocking. You know, you, you, you just, you're just like, what is going on there? And so was your diet, I mean, you know, I mean, and, and Zach will probably say, I mean, there's a lot of products that athletes take. I mean, it's not, not so, I mean, it's gels, it's goose, it's, you know, sports drinks. I mean, was that something that, you know, was 
I mean, what, what were you eating for the years that you were, you were an athlete and having problems with inflammation and pain and joint pain and fatigue? What was the diet like back then? I, I've always eaten pretty well. Like I've probably been majority gluten-free for, for many, many years, I would say. Um, even back then, I wouldn't have been eating much gluten, you know, around 2012. You know, I would be pretty good. I would cut out ice cream for a couple of months leading into the race. Um, and I wouldn't have eaten, eaten a lot of it the rest of the year. So sugars, I was moderate, I would say. So, but that still meant I ate it every day because I was still having, you know, a recovery drink or I was still having a drink in training. I was still having gels in training, but a moderate amount, but even just like dribbling them in still is going to affect you quite often. Um, so yeah, I ate well back then, but it was, it wasn't anything like now I was still having, you know, brown rice often. And I was having, you know, plenty of plants still that could have been causing some inflammation. And um, the funny thing is a lot of it's genetic as well. So my mum has a couple of autoimmune conditions also, and she's finding huge improvements on the carnivore diet and lowering her drugs that she's been on for 10 to 30 years, some of them. Um, so I do have that genetic factor of that. Yeah, I'm just more susceptible. So partly it is what I did to my body. And it partly was that my cells were already going to be more susceptible to stress than, and a reactive condition than, uh, than not just because of the genetics as well, but definitely now that I can train without all those sugars, like it's, it, it feels good to not, to know that I'm not constantly topping up my gut bugs and getting them to, breed on sugars and those kind of other aspects. So even if I were, and, and people often say to me, Oh, but if you could change, like if you get really healthy and things improve, well, maybe your diet will look different in, in several years time. And I'm sort of thinking, well, I can see all the benefits of me. I can see that the plant benefits aren't there. And maybe, maybe if I wanted to, I could have a few and there'd be some flavors that'd be great. Like some herbs would be, you know, in my eggs and some meals would be fascinating and, and tasty. But at the same time, like I'm never going to go back to eating processed grains or I'm never going to go back to eating, you know, ice cream or any of those sort of things. So I'm pretty comfortable knowing that, you know, the carnivore diet is just has only benefits and not none of the detriments that the, you know, that my previous diet had for me. So it's, um, yeah, I don't, I can't see that. I'm not going to say I'll never change, but you know, I'm in the same boat as you that I think that even if I felt amazing all the time and my body could handle a bit of other things, you know, I'd be, I'd be quite happy to leave them out and just stick to a, a natural diet that is just real, you know, unprocessed foods all the time. Yeah. I mean, I think that's fair. And I, and I do think, and I've certainly seen people that, that do, the diet for, you know, six months a year and, and maybe they add a few things, maybe a few seasonal berries and stuff like that. And I, I think that's perfectly fine for many people, but mm. I think that, uh, and I, and I'm, you know, I, I saw the caveat, you know, the never say never thing is always kind of a little scary because I think you never know what's going to happen, but let me walk me through because you are, you know, like I said, presumably getting back to training at a very high level of, of performance, you know, an elite level world-class performance athlete how are you managing your training around, you know, diet right now? What are you eating? How, how do you, how does that work for you? Like talk, walk us through your training a little bit as it is currently. Um, I generally would train fasted in the morning. Um, so whether that's swimming, riding or running and then come back and I'll just eat, you know, probably at least around a kilo of meat of some sort, just mince or, you know, some off cut slow cooked or, um, but when I say slow cooked now, everything's like pressure cooked and I cook it quick because of the, I'm trying to keep the histamine low. Um, but around a kilo of meat and then, you know, I probably that'll do me and might have a bit of a snack on some fat throughout the day. Maybe just a, if I'm a bit, bit peckish, like a spoonful of tallow and some salt or something, um, have another little training session. And then at the moment I'm doing, you know, one, two, one, two to three meals a day. So if I'm kind of not doing a huge training day, um, I might just have two big meals and eat dinner quite early. Um, and then other days, if I am training a bit more and yeah, just hungrier, then I might end up eating more like closer to closer to three kilos of meat. So I might generally eat two, one kilo meals and then 
um, other meals. I might just chuck in a bit more, a bit more meat um, in between those meals, but I haven't figured out, like I said, like it's only been about a month since I was like, Oh, that histamine thing's been an issue. So now I'm, I'm still getting little bits of symptoms here and there, but adjusting my, my eating patterns for that. So everything's frozen. I get it out. It's quick, quick cook in the pressure cooker. Um, and so what I thought was, was good. Now I've had to change again because when we, we went away and we raced a couple of races in Japan, um, my wife, Jamie and I, and when we were in Japan, that was sort of, I felt great. My consistency was really good. And then we came home and I'd had some meat aging in the fridge for like five weeks in a dry age bag. And that just was the worst flare up I've had all year after I ate that. And I also ate some dairy like yogurts and some hard cheeses. That was the worst two weeks I've had all year because of the, and I didn't know why I was like, hang on, I've just been eating the basically the same foods in Japan. And I couldn't figure out that it was because it was aged meat. So in Japan it was, you know, I went to the supermarket, bought it every day. And then I ate it that day pretty much. And whereas at home, I suddenly ate all this aged meat and things and aged cheeses and yogurts. And I've spent, there was probably about two weeks of feeling really rubbish. And in that there was two days where my brain just was so foggy that I couldn't even barely get off the couch and do anything. So it's, I can sympathize with anybody that's had any sort of depression, brain fog symptoms where no one understands that it's black and white. And like, they just like, come on, let's just go for a walk. Let's just go for a swim in the beach. And it's like, you don't want to do anything. Your body and brain do not have the energy. So it's still those times of figuring out is energy coming from the food or is energy coming from inflammation is kind of the story of my life. <laughs> you know, where is it coming from? So I'm still trying to figure that out. Is the energy coming from food or is the energy coming from um, inflammation? So still got, still got a few more things to muck about with a little bit, but definitely getting closer to, to having the answer. And I'm not yet at like where I want to be at. I think, you know, I want to be at world-class again. I want to get back to competing and getting on the podium in, in the Hawaii Ironman. Um, but to get there, it's just going to take longer for me to get my body a, the consistency in training, kind of you need a couple of years to build back up to that. But then B, just to get the consistency in, um, you know, my fatigue and my gut lining because, you know, I'm still getting little autoimmune reactions here and there that will throw my training out for a few days. But, you know, I'm back to where I was when I was in my 20s um, with a little bit of fatigue. Whereas, you know, I want to get to, you know, where there's no fatigue. So we just got to figure out a few more things. Pete, let me just, uh, and Zach, you can certainly chime in here, but I'm just kind of, you know, because you said, I mean, it's nice to see you're eating enough. I like to see this two kilos, three kilos, because I think for athletes, they underestimate how much they, they actually need to get, to get through to, to maintain what they're doing. And, you know, I routinely, two kilos a day is nothing for me. And I've, I've certainly gone three and even more. Uh, and I'm not doing the distance you do. And my stuff is all short, you know, intense lifting and sprinting and stuff. But well, let me, because you said you do fasted training and, what what are the like a morning workout after fast and how long would that be because there's people that would say you can't do work above a th certain threshold if it lasts longer than an hour or, or whatever so what what is your like what would a typical training session be what would the intensity level be you know without basically you know carbohydrates yeah. where are you where are you at with that well i'm now currently um probably i can go out and do like a four hour ride and, and the intensity is not huge, but you know, when you hit hills, it's up there. So I train a lot to math, you know, maximum aerobic function. So that's around, you know, 180 minus your age for me, it's about 143, but you know, I'll, I'll hit 150 and still feel that I'm very aerobic at that level. Um, hitting some hills in that time frame as well. And, you know, four hours I can do fine in training. And then the races that I've done, the half Ironmans that I've done this year, so no carbohydrates, no carb loading for breakfast. It might've been like a, a boiled egg or something. And that is high intensity. That's heart rate of 160, um, pretty much going as hard as you can for four hours. And, um, yeah, I haven't run out of any sugars. Like I haven't bonked and I haven't, I crossed the finish line and I feel fine. I don't run for a Coke cause I feel like my, my blood sugar is crashing. And then it might be another hour or so before I even get like a tin of fish or a couple of boiled eggs again. 
and it's yeah absolutely fine it goes back to just yep yeah, still on the zero carb diet afterwards beforehand and so those races of four hours at really high intensity have been quite the experiment so i have used ketone esters i use caffeine um, i am gonna just test out some nicotine gum um, because that's what happens when you when you start going zero carb and doing these efforts in training and racing you start to question okay where is the energy coming from and I love all Tim Noakes stuff um, and Alex Hutchinson endure the book. Um, and so you start to think, okay, what's the brain's response to where this energy is coming from? And um, so, yeah, I, I'm looking more into stimulants in, term, in many ways, whether that be through a um, mindset type stimulus or whether it be through, like I say, kif- caffeine or nicotine, um, ketone esters, um, and even just a rinse and spit with a carbohydrate drink or something, if I feel that I don't want to have the sugars. So there's still plenty more to kind of experiment with, but it's, it's funny that, yeah, it, it, it really comes down to perception of energy. Yeah. You know, you said a few things that I was uh, just taking inventory in my own mind about kind of what I've done in the past too. And it seems to me like, well, I'll do like sessions that are kind of similar to that where it's like upwards to four or four hours and I'll be you know, more or less fasted going in and not fueling during it. And those feel fine where I sometimes run into issues is, uh, or I don't know if I'd say issues, but where I start to kind of manipulate or, you know, add in a little more carbohydrate is when I have a session like that. And then another one the next day or a session like that, and maybe a gym workout that afternoon or some, some, something similar to that. And that's where I found it, it, at least, you know, I mean, teasing it out as hard as it always is, but like, um, like the, you know, I could just be using the carbohydrates in place of something else that could work just as well. Like the exogenous ketones, more caffeine or something like that, I guess. But, um, that's kind of what I've noticed. And then I'll be curious to see kind of what you notice when you move into some of the longer races to like the full Ironman do you have any idea? Oh, maybe I should ask first, are you fueling on nothing during the four hour sessions or are you taking in some sort of fat in there? Yeah. At the moment it's been nothing in training, um, water and salt and maybe occasionally like I'll take a little bit of a caffeine tab. So I might have half a caffeine tab. Um, if I feel I need something, um, and like I don't drink coffee at all anymore. So day to day I'm on no caffeine. Um, and, yeah, basically for the full Ironman, it still is a little bit go by feel like it is going to be a little bit of let's just see what happens. So I know that at the end of the day, there's aid stations everywhere. So I would, but I don't, I mean, the thing is I'm not going out and doing an ultra in the middle of the desert where if I don't take enough, I'm in real trouble. I've got stuff all the time that I can grab if I need to from aid stations. I would generally carry a little bit of something with me as well. And so there's that, that's the backup plan. The backup plan is like, Oh, if I feel I need some sugar, it's there Mm -hmm. and it's not a worry. Um, I think with training, I may like earlier this year, I tried doing honey um, in my drink bottles, but as I was transitioning more to like zero sugars and zero plants, the honey was even giving me a little like in stomach cramps in training. So there is that kind of, well, that balance of, what can I eat? And I guess that's the question of, I would, I would be doing what you were doing, Zach, if I could, but mm-hmm. at the same time, like I'm so, my guts are so sensitive that I'm still having issues with basically anything um, that I'm steering clear of having, you know, even honey or even a little bit of starch or carbohydrates. So that I'm just like, you know, got to just steer clear of that. So if I had the option, I would, but the fact that I don't have the option is also, it, it's forced me into this other experiment and this other side of things. So I do, if I get, I'm just still waiting for like some really good consistency, like months worth of consistency to be able to dial in like, okay, what food made me recover better um, and how much of it and how can I manipulate that a little bit more? Yeah. You know, you're, you're hitting a lot of things that I'm really interested in and some conversations I've had in the past too, when, you know, you'll get in a conversation with you know, someone who's more or less an absolutist 
where it's like, you know, 60, 70% carbohydrate is the way to go. No questions asked. If you can't do that, you know, pack your bags and go home, that type of mentality. And my thought is just like, well, okay, I understand that that's what like these Olympic medalists and record breakers are doing, but is that a result of, because what we're doing is we're weeding out all the people that would need a different approach by forcing this one very specific way of eating onto everyone. And then ultimately you're going to get the people who are super robust and can tolerate that rising to the top who also have the superior genetic genes and also have the phenomenal work ethic. You know, there's our gold medalists, but what about the person like yourself? You know, if you change course early enough, you does it with us, even if it's just a slightly different way, let's maybe not as extreme as what you have to do, but something similar to what I'm doing. Could we have saved some athletes that would otherwise be high caliber, but they fall to the wayside and give up because it's like they're beating their head against the wall, trying to get 60, 70% of the whole grains, fruits and vegetables in. And that's just not working for them. Yeah. And every session that they are doing has to be like, basically they have to get their aggression up and they like going on four coffees or something just to get their body through the session because it's in so much pain and agony and it's aches every day that they wake up and they're getting surgeries and you know all of these other type of things so they don't relate that to anything to do with food and nutrition um and they just see that as oh no i got this injury because of you know i i ran really hard or something or they don't even know why they got it they just right just injury has nothing to do with nutrition or the reason that they need a whole heap of caffeine has nothing to do with nutrition or their, you know, the way that their body's getting smashed from things. So, yeah, I mean, if, if anything, um, people cutting out gluten and increasing their fat would be a huge, huge benefit to most people. Like they could still be on a high carb diet, but just cut mm -hmm. out, you know, a few of those inflammatory things that are the worst and then the processed foods and start cutting out all the numbers and additives that are wrecking their gut lining. I think you'd be surprised how many athletes and, and people in general, like I think everybody thinks they're absolutely fine. But when you go like, Oh, so how's your like bowel movements? And generally they're like 50% of the people are probably going to be, Oh, well I have diarrhea. Like, you know, a lot of the time <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, you could be better than you are. Um, if you started like researching and looking into this thing. So it's, um, but at the same time, so that's what I like. I've got a young guy that I'm mentoring and I'm just trying to live the little steps. He's young and he's still so good, but little things like I'm just trying to get him off gluten all the time. So just like, just take it off the options and just don't ever have the gluten. Um, so little baby steps at that point. And I think a lot of people would benefit from those sort of things. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the, the injury one is especially interesting and it's, you know, we've normalized it where like, well, you're, you're a professional athlete. You're going to have those hurdles eventually. And then, then you see someone who never gets injured and everyone just looks at them as an anomaly. Like, Oh, well, they're just super lucky. They're just more durable for whatever reason. And yeah. <laughs> or when they do get an injury, they're just like, Oh, well, they just got that injury because they're so hard that they were able to push their push, body yeah. beyond its breaking point. And it's like, no, that's so dumb that they pushed their body beyond breaking point. And I think stress fractures are a big thing for a lot of people that aren't eating much protein. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, it's quite interesting how many people have gotten stress fractures who are also on the vegetarian diet um, or just even if they're not vegetarian, they still are eating like quite a small amount of protein, you know, day to day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, that's our, that, that, that is, you know, something that's not that uncommon. We see that with, with people that are, you know, eating a deficient diet. And some people will say that stress fractures are kind of a harbinger for metabolic syndrome and diabetes and prediabetes. And so that's mm -hmm. something to be concerned about. Let me ask you about, because I mean, we always talk about performance. We talk about game day performance and it's how do you fuel for that? But I mean, really, when, when it goes into performance, it's really what you've done for the three months, six months prior to the, to the event that really counts. And then if we look at it over a career, you know, it's how you've treated your body over the years. Now, are you noticing, because you were at the beginning here, you were talking about, I took the year off because my ankles and feet and joints were hurting and pain. Have you seen a re improvement in that aspect or what have you seen as improvements in, in, in aspects of your health uh, with change in diet or if any? Yeah, I don't get, any aches and pains anymore like my my body is 
is really good in terms of muscles and, and inflammation in that sense. I'm still just getting like a bit of psoriasis and some like bit of fatigue, brain foggy kind of feeling. So all the aches and pains are gone. So even if I'm running, you know, I'll go out and run like two hours the next day, everything's fine when I wake up. So I don't even, I don't get massages anymore just cause I'm not like walking around feeling like, Oh, you know, I've got this knot in my back or my leg and things. So I do a little bit of mobility. I do a little bit of foam rolling, but, you know, compared to how I used to feel after training, like nothing compares. So muscle wise and joints, everything is a thousand times better. It's now just trying to get that last little bit, which is just causing that little bit of brain fog and, and, and psoriasis. So that gut lining is still a little bit too sensitive. So that's the next thing. Okay. Let's, let's try and get that a bit more robust so that um, things aren't causing inflammation from the gut lining. But it's incredible to feel like, you know, you don't need that much body work to be feeling good day to day now. So that's, um, that's the biggest, biggest, biggest benefit of cutting out the plants. Yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting because we've had this uh, mobility sort of tissue suppleness sort of uh, awareness and, you know, I would go to the gym and, you know, I, since I've been on low carb diets and, and now carnivorous diets for, you know, half a decade now, I mean, I don't really, really even need to warm up. I can get out there and perform. I mean, with minimal warm up to none, you know, I don't have aches and pains. I'm the same way. I go to bed, you know, maybe a little beat up from the training of the day, but I wake up the next day and I'm good to go. And I think it's something that I would go to the gym and I would see somebody I mean, literally, they do their mobility work, their stretches, their foam rolling. I mean, they're there for 45 minutes doing that stuff to prepare to work out. And meanwhile, I'm already, I've already finished my workout and, and you know, I'm putting my stuff in my bag to go home. And I'm just like, this seems a little bit odd. And if you look at animals in nature, I mean, it's not like if a fox is going to chase a rabbit, the rabbit's not like, wait a minute, hold on, guys. I got to do stretching. I got to <laughs> – I mean, I think animals in a while, you should just be able to get out there and run. I mean, and I think if you – are operating efficiently, even as a 50 year old, you know, or I'm a 52 year old guy, I can get out there and run a sprint without having to stretch and warm up. I can just go. And I think that's how animals operate. And I think humans are animals. And I think our diet and lifestyle, you know, I mean, it's more than diet, but our lifestyle in general turns us into these sort of people that can't do anything without preparation, which I don't think is natural. And I think it's interesting to see and you're not alone. I've seen that comment. And, and even Zach will tell you, you know, he just got done running a hundred miles and, you know, in years past, he'd, he'd hobble around like an old woman for, for three or four days. And, and I don't know, Zach, correct me if I'm wrong, but now you're saying with a better diet strategy, that has been improved tremendously. Yeah. Like in, in, it's been kind of a, a more or less a consistent trend with other folks I've worked with or or talk to that follow a similar one. And, you know, Jeff Browning, we had on the show before that was like one of the biggest things he noticed. He was like so surprised. He, had, I mean, and this is a guy who'd run like 1600 milers before he had switched and then was just like shocked the next day that would, he, that he could bend his knees. He's like, this is a possibility. <laughs> so, I mean, I think there's, there's definitely something there. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, the, um, oh, I use ahead. the analogy of, um, like a cheater all the time that the cheetah doesn't train to run fast. It just is fast because it's so supple and it's so healthy. And as well as the food aspect of things, what we touched on before was like training to, to math heart rate as well. So my math heart rate at the moment is not brilliant. I've got work to do, but let's say I'm running about four minute K pace in all my training. I don't do anything faster than that in training. But when it comes to a race, like I, I'm running three thirties after three hours of exercise and my heart rate's like at 155 or something. So just because I'm healthier and because I've done this aerobic base, when I need to, I can just run faster in training. I can push my heart rate. I can push the pace and it all just comes like easy basically because I've got this base of the cells and, and health and fat burning ability. Everything's aerobic as well as that. I've just got this um, ability from training and at a, an aerobic pace just to be able to go faster when I need to. Yeah. The maximum aerobic function stuff is interesting. Cause I, I, I say like, I tell folks who are interested in it, I was like, you know, if nothing else, it's a great place to start. Cause once you maximize that or you find yourself kind of maybe plateau at a specific pace at that mm -hmm. heart rate, 
then there's really no direction you can't go. Like you could decide to peak for a 5k then, or you could decide to peak for a hundred mile then. And you'd be have the, the foundation that you would need for that. And I, I remember I did a training block once where I, I did, I, it was pretty strict maximum aerobic function. And I was just curious to see like, well, what happens if I try to run faster than that? And I went in a half marathon and uh, you know, averaged like a, a 520 my, minute per mile pace, which is a good 40 seconds faster per mile than what my maximum aerobic function pace was at that time. So it does kind of bleed into some of those other systems of training a bit when you really get it fine tuned. Yeah. A lot of people will actually get like PRs when they have just been training aerobically and then just jump in for a 5k race. And there was a study <laughs> on that a long time ago and Phil Maffetone, you know, and, and it was after that they all PR'd and then they asked Phil like, Oh, so, you know, what, what's the next phase of training now? And he's like, well, you've just gone and run personal records after doing this. Why would you go and change anything? Like you've just run faster than you've ever run. Like, why do you feel this need to be like, okay, now I need to start pushing my body harder. Cause it's sort of like, well, let's just, you know, you just, why it doesn't kind of make sense all the time. And so it's not that there's not a time and place for doing it but this constant need to believe that it's the only way to get faster is to um, do hard efforts is, you know, not necessarily true. And obviously you're just risking the injury and burnout and mm -hmm. so many other factors. And Phil, I know I've talked to Phil a bit about this in the past too. And he said like, well, if you really feel like you need the speed work, then you'll just jump in some races and you'll get it there. <laughs> so he's like, you're doing math during the week and a 5k on the weekend, you do that for a few weeks, so then, you know, then you're kind of uh, where you need to be, I think. So he's, it's just an interesting angle to work it from. Yeah. And then at least you're not training your ego to be more involved because most people, when they start doing efforts in training, it's very much, oh, well, well that, that, that one kilometer was this pace. So I want to make the next one faster. And then, and then I want to make the next one faster than that. And um, kind of just go down this rabbit hole of, you know, enough is never enough kind of thing. Mm-hmm. No, nah, I think we've all been there. <laughs> it's the, the high school track and cross country mentality. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I'm still there for some time. Yeah. Well, that's, what, that's why you haven't got past the high intensity stuff yet. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Well, I mean, you know, granted, I'm not doing what you guys are doing with the, the distance work. So I think there is a little bit of difference in, in, in that type of stuff. What have you... Uh, Pete, what have you, I mean, I know you, you kind of touched on this, but I mean, as far as, uh, you know, now that you're in your, you know, mid thirties training different than you, I, presumably in your twenties, are you finding that your training strategy, uh, the diet is, is more suited to a certain training style rather than others? I mean, do you, do you find that, uh, you know, well, let, let's just see what you yeah. have to say about that. What, what do you yeah. think the diet, the diet lends itself to? I mean, it definitely lends itself to doing the math work at the aerobic work. Um, and it basically means that you can do many, many hours of it, as I said, and, and basically be faster during it and not have to be taking in sugars while you're training, which is a great benefit to the gut and, and flow on effects. But, and then, yeah, I haven't noticed that. I think it's, it's more a result of that. I haven't been doing much hard work in training in terms of sprints and things that it feels average if I do sprint, not so much that my diet has meant that I'm not able to do the sprints. Um, so like having 2018 off, like that really did change things in my body, I think, where the body really like took a break. So I'm still coming back from having that time off and I'm still getting my body fitter and healthier to a point where it's then going to be ready to then do more like some speed work in training that's going to feel good like to be able to just do like some maximum 100 meter sprints and those kind of efforts that i do feel will benefit me um at the time when i'm ready for them but the diet itself is just um like i've done a lot of blood sugar testing and, and ketone testing and pricking my finger while i've been on the bike and that's been really interesting because when i like any time that I get my heart rate up over about about 160, so about 15 beats above my math, it you know I I I'm in a stressed state, so therefore my liver's releasing blood sugars. So my blood sugars increase as I need the energy. So 
for people to say, oh, well, if you're doing high intensity workout, you need to be eating sugars. It's like, well, no, because your body always has sugars. And if you stress your body out with a hard effort, it will release the sugars. So that's what's happening for me in the races where my heart rate is getting up high. That's what's happening in training. Um, and so that's been a really interesting, you know, revelation in my training and just be like, oh, okay, that's, that's why you don't necessarily need to eat carbohydrates to do a hard effort because, and I think that's almost also where people are possibly doing themselves more damage when they say, if you do a high intensity effort, that's when you need to reload with carbohydrates more so or take on carbohydrates during that effort to have a good effort. And I think, well, your blood sugars are already up. So you actually could be doing a bit of disservice to the adaptation that you're trying to gain by just overloading the, the levels of your blood sugars. And then you're causing more inflammation afterwards from the high intensity effort. As, as Zach says, like he doesn't, he kind of lowers his carbs after the hard races. Um, whereas a lot of people are generally having more carbs after their hard training. And, um, just doesn't seem to make sense physiologically uh at this point i think i think the interesting thing too about what you said is like when the intensity is high enough where it brings the duration down to a point where you're not gonna exhaust your muscle and liver glycogen you know you're in a kind of a unique situation but if you say like lower the intensity just a little bit so that you can stretch out that duration a lot longer I think that's where people maybe run into a little bit of trouble if they're trying to do, say, like, you know, a, like an ultra marathon or something like that at peak performance without any exogenous carbohydrate source. Because at that point, in order for you to kind of maintain those glycogen reserves, we'd have to assume that gluconeogenesis is happening at a fast enough pace to replenish those stores, you know, within the time frame that you're out there already burning, like, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 800 calories per hour. So, mm -hmm. like, I know um, it's yeah, my, I, my approach would be like put in as much as you need mm -hmm. and try and keep blood sugar around five would mm -hmm. be like what I would be suggesting. Yeah. yeah it's just a slow drip. And it, it, that's, that's pretty close to what I ended up doing and pretty close to what I think Jeff does too, is like it, the thing we've recognized the most is that you can get the same effect for a, a minimal dosage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's where it would be interesting to kind of go back to what you said before, where maybe once you get things a little more dialed, or if you find yourself in a situation where you're out there on the course and you need something, you can play around a little bit with the fuel sources. I'll be curious to see, like, assuming it doesn't do anything negative to your digestion, like how much more of a pop you get from just a very little, um, as I, I, the way I explain it to people is like when I was high carb, like, you know, I could be pounding like 80 grams an hour of, uh, of uh, just basically sports fuel and just feel like that was keeping me like more or less on razor's edge, but not, not ever feeling like, you know, super great. Or if I fell off that, I would start to fall apart pretty quickly. Whereas now I'm going to do a, a real low, a much lower kind of drip in and feel super consistent throughout the whole course of it, which is just way less of a roller coaster ride. And it's, it's, it's really interesting though. So how much did you end up having in the run and, and like what was your average heart rate in the 100 mile record? Yeah, so uh, I haven't even looked at the heart rate data yet. I, I, I do have it, I think, because I had a, it was an indoor event, so I didn't have GPS on my watch, but I have a heart rate monitor. I haven't looked at the heart rate stuff yet. Um, intake, I was, I actually went a little higher than I normally do and partly just because it was so cool in there, I, I assumed I'd be able to get away with a little more. So I was hitting probably about 40 grams an hour, which is the high end of what I'll normally target for an A race. I'll go as low as 20 grams an hour sometimes too. Uh, it all just kind of depends on the environment to some degree. And uh, the only other thing I had in there, I basically did the same thing all day. Like that entire 40 grams per hour was basically this X endurance fuel five stuff that I'll use for races. And then, uh, uh, there's these little, I use these Unamate packets that have, it's basically an instant Yerba Mate. And I use that as a caffeine source and started at, at five hours. I'd put one of those in every hour. And, and that just, my stomach didn't really bother me at all the whole time. And, uh, I felt really even. So it was, a uh, kind of a fun, fun experiment. 
Yeah, and so you haven't delved into using ketones or um, other supplements at all late yet then? Not, not in races. I've played around with some in kind of just training and stuff. And I'm, I'm actually talking to some folks right now that have some of the more like really good clinical stuff uh, that I'm going to test out a bit. You know, the, I did do a little bit of a, a test for another company a while back where they wanted me to basically just see what was happening. And they sent me this little like canister of it and it shot me up from like 1.0 millimoles in the morning to like 3.7. Mm. And they, they told me like that wasn't even all that impressive. They had people <laughs> who were like shooting up much higher than that. But it, that's, that's kind of the next thing I want to kind of play around with a little bit and see what, what's going on with that stuff. Mm. Hey, Pete, I wanted to add, cause you said you were testing your blood glucose during runs. How, how high were you seeing those numbers and what does it compare to you like your normal kind of resting numbers? Yeah, well, resting numbers are always below five. So like mid fours around there kind of thing, um, four and a half to five, but it got up to about 5.6 maybe. And that's like faster just from doing a bit of an intensity on the bike. Um, and so it's interesting that you start to realize that that, also plays into why people would often why, why a cool down is beneficial you know i guess sometimes people would say oh no you can finish feeling strong and finish without a cool down but i think if you have done an intensity effort one of the main reasons for then doing a cool down is to try and get that blood sugar back to kind of a base level where you just keep it uptaking into the muscles while you keep exercising rather than finishing with that high blood sugar level so that was another bit of a, you know, theory of mine anyway. And I keep coming up with theories when I'm figuring out what's going on, because um, as you know, Sean, the, the, the research is like really, really minimal in terms of what's going on in the body at certain times, especially around a carnivore diet and exercise. So, you know, I've got a lot of theories I'd love to test out, but, um, and trying to find some research on certain things. It's like, Oh, this hasn't actually been tested yet. So it's such a, you know, stepping into the unknown and every day is an experiment kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's fascinating to feel that if leading some of these theories and, and coming up with new theories, it's, it's kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we had a uh, show way, way back. One of our very first shows, we had a guy named uh, Alessandro Ferretti and, uh, we, uh, we, we kind of discussed some of the studies out there that looked at athletes, uh, you know, relatively, you know, high caliber athletes and their blood glucose. And we were seeing that their blood glucose was regularly hitting pre-diabetic, diabetic range uh, throughout their exercise efforts and even, even sometimes in the fasting state. So it's kind of, I think it's, I think the athletic physiology is a little bit different than what we think about the standard sort of sedentary person's physiology when it comes to glucose and even now there's data coming out that maybe glucose is not the main driver of diabetic pathophysiology maybe it's more of a mitochondrial effect and you know we've talked about insulin and the effect on that so i think we're we're, we're it's nice that these people are doing these experiments you know you got people doing extreme experiments like zach you know running running his 100 mile races low carb and you know me doing carnivore you doing this stuff and we're seeing a lot of things that kind of make us rethink what we thought we knew about basic human physiology, because it's probably far more complex and nuanced than we ever imagined. And the problem is we just kind of take blanket population data and, and try to apply it to every person equally. And it, it just, it, it usually doesn't work very well. And I think we're finding that out. Yeah. And that's why I'm loving in this journey, getting into the, um, you know, all the mind stuff, perception is everything. So Tim Noakes, central governor theory and um, that side of things, because it's just, again, we're aware of it, but we're not, no one's utilizing it good enough at, at that high level. Like in 2012, I was using like a trigger word and I was using visualization and I went into that race and just was like in control and calm in the moment, like every time, all the time. And I was making all the right decisions because of that. And as in uh, yeah it's just not talked about that much and many athletes are not working on how to control their brain to get the most out of their body and um, I think that's totally underutilized as much as a low carb diet is yeah Do you th oh go ahead Zach I, no, I, I was just say <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say like I was thinking about that exact thing after my race on Saturday because I was trying to think like 
I felt like I was more mentally ready for this one than I had been in the past. And one of the things I found was really motivating at the near the end of it was just remembering like past failures. And it's like, well, if I didn't have those past failures, I wouldn't have that, you know, that motivation there to, to feed off of. So, you know, it's like you, you want to avoid the mistake you made in the past. So by making that mistake and then getting in another opportunity, it's like you have that in kind of your, your, your hopper as when things get tough, you'd be like, you think back to like, you don't want to have to have that happen again. (laughs) (laughs) And anything you can use for motivation, anything you can kind of use, I think being in the moment and being in the zone is, is like really good. And obviously anyone can practice that really easily. And um, it's just like a meditative process to just be in the moment, but you don't need to spend hours and hours meditating to, to get there. Um, but then, yeah, pain tolerance is one of the key things mentioned in the central governor theory and, and motivation. So are you using up all your pain tolerance early in the race? Or, and are you using up all your motivation and your, your hormones that allow that motivation early in the race? So being calm and in control and in the moment, you know, as um, comes back to that central governor theory. And it's, uh, it's just such a cool aspect of our sport. Yeah, I, I think that the mind is, I mean, you know, and I, I do a lot of things where I'm going to what I think is failure or what my mind allows me to do, but it very much is a mental thing for me. I mean, I know physically, physically, I'm able to do things only if my mind allows me to do them, you know, whereas like I say, I'm physically prepared to do it, but then on the day, for some reason, the brain says, nah, it's not going to happen today. But let me ask you guys, both you and Zach, uh, do you think, I mean, Zach, obviously you've shown that a low carb athlete can, can run the fastest hundred miles in the world, or at least you know, at this point, do you think there are any sporting events, distances, intensities where a low carbohydrate athlete could not be among the best in the world? Is there anything out there you say that's, there's no, like, like some people said the marathon, it's just impossible to run a 210 marathon without, you know, a high carb athlete. What, what are you guys thoughts on, on any specific, you know, is there an absolute, you can't do this as a low carb athlete? I think, like, and this is just my own suspicions. I think you could still do a low car, like a higher fat approach for the marathon. I think it would have to look quite a bit different from like maybe a classic ketogenic style of like 30 to 50 grams of carbohydrates. Um, but I think like, I, and I, I think the periodization is where it really gets interesting because I think people tend to think of like these folks as doing the same thing every day like what you would get in most people's lives probably. Whereas, you know, you know, even an elite Olympic, like if, if, if you said like, okay, for whatever reason, I was talented enough to get to the Olympics in the marathon and it was three years away. It's like, well, that's, you know, that's three years of building I'm going to do to prepare for that single event. So like what I do in year one might be a little different than I do in year two, which might be a little different than I do in year, year three. But, uh, um, yeah, I think a lot of times people want to look at a small slice of that as opposed to the the whole thing. So there'd be segments of the year where I'd probably, I think that like a 210 marathoner could go keto or strict keto, like right after their big races during like deload weeks and things like that. Um, but I think they're probably going to need some carbohydrate, at, at least to the degree that I use it when they start getting into that kind of peak training and that racing phase of things. Um, but it'll be interesting. I think, I mean, I'm, I hope that we'll see some, some options of that being tried at the moment or or not in the moment, but down the road as it gets a little more maybe momentum behind it to see exactly what people can do with that. And like where those numbers maybe normalize. Yeah. I think, I think it is, I want to say it's, it's totally a guess because I guess I'm not in any of these sports that would be like, Mm -hmm. you know, like an 800 meter or a 400 meter track or something that's really, fast high energy um but the approach would have to be totally different to the current approach i think it would require doing like um a totally different training plan um i think it would require really dialing food and it would take years like as as zach said i think it would take years of trying to get it right because it would mean training in a totally different mindset um, as much as a different intake of fuel. So as I mean, tested, 
And yeah, so I'm not going to say it's, it's not possible anywhere because I think it's not something that anyone's tried even close to do. I think in any of those studies that have shown that somebody hasn't adapted to a high fat diet and therefore in their one hour bike time trial, their performance was lower or their race walk or whatever the, the athletes were, that wasn't over an extended period with a specific training program that would have brought forward the benefits of a low carb diet, I guess. So there's just so many factors is my point. I think any of these studies have not taken everything into account and not enough time in training, not enough time on the diet, not enough blood markers and, um, you know, different, different ways. And every athlete is different. Some athletes are going to respond much better with more pure aerobic base and others are going to be respond better with maybe a 20% of max sprints and others are going to respond better with a bit of threshold in there. So there's so many variables that, you know, hopefully in the future that there's more people that are interested in it and aren't necessarily doing it because like myself, they're forced into it because of bad health and they're already a fair way down that road um, before they need to correct it. But hopefully some, yeah, top athletes are, are starting to get interested in this before they um, start wrecking their body. Well, I think it'll be interesting too, as we get further down the road, just from a holistic standpoint too, because, you know, we're going to have kids now who've had parents who, for whatever reason, got into a, a higher fat, low carb diet. And by default, their kids are eating closer to that. And, you know, because I think of myself, like, yeah, I've been doing a version of a high fat, low carb diet for the basically the last eight years. But, you know, that leaves me with 25 years that I wasn't. So. <laughs> Um, what happens when you have a 33 year old who's been doing it from day one or something close to it from day one? Is there, is their experience going to be slightly different than mine, drastically different than mine? It's like, I guess we don't know, but, uh, it'd be mm. really fun to find out. What do you think, Zach? I know we've talked about this on several occasions, but like see Pete's input on this. And so, I mean, there is a sort of a ketogenic approach and it's a very high fat, low carbohydrate. And it's often, often, underpowered with regard to protein in my view and that's one of the one of the distinguishing difference between either a meat-based keto, ketogenic diet or you know purely carnivorous diet is that you have quite a bit more protein and, and we know that you know protein can serve as a sub or the amino acids can serve as a substrate for gluconeogenesis and it may allow for more efficiency we said we efficiency in that we had professor don layman on talking about in animal studies that are fed high protein diets their liver glycogen does not get depleted overnight. And so they end up with a you know, fairly replete liver glycogen status when they wake up in the morning. And so do you find that maybe there's, a, you know, even in the low carb realm, there's a difference once we start accounting for protein? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, go ahead, Pete. You go first. <laughs> yeah, those, those are kind of the, some of the tests that I'd love to see. Like actually, if you can test liver glycogen stores and muscle glycogen stores after somebody's, been on a carnivore diet perhaps they've done like a an Ironman race or just some solid training throughout their training like what is going on exactly with protein and you know I know Paul Mason's like a, a good proponent of having a high protein diet um, and myself I think high protein has kind of favored my gut system a bit better than a high fat because it does seem to go through me a little bit more so than, and I guess the total quantity of food that I'm eating, if it's high fat, then that just um, gives me a bit of a reaction. But I do feel that there's a lot of, um, I mean, a lot of disagreement, isn't there? Because you've got the whole camp that there's one camp that says the only source of fuel is fat and carbohydrates. And if you're, but that protein is not a fuel source at all. And yet, as you said, um, Sean, and I kind of agree with that, if you're getting enough protein, you're getting gluconeogenesis and your liver is restoring glycogen levels, then you've always got enough glycogen to get through whatever training you need to get through. And I think that's where people are still stuck on this little bit of more is better, maybe like more liver glycogen or more muscle glycogen is therefore better. But when you're fat adapted, I mean, 90% of the training, even if you're doing like an 80-20 approach, which would be what most people who are still doing a high intensity training are probably still doing 80% aerobic 20%. So at high intensity. And at that point, it's like, well, 80% is still not touching that 
glycogen storage if you are fat adapted and eating a carnivore diet. So, you know, how much do you need? And I think that's the question that nobody really knows. Yeah. And that kind of actually also partly answers what you asked about before too, Sean, where like, you know, can someone get away with a ketogenic or a high fat, low carb diet at some of these elite traditional distances. And it's like, there's that component to it too, where like, you, you know, you even take a, a shorter endurance event, and they're going to be spending uh, quite a bit of time in that aerobic zone. So there'd be that sparing but with the gluconeogenesis side of things. I think it's really interesting and I think like if we were to have say an athlete do meet their max potential, so to speak on a, on a diet that's super low in carbohydrate, I can't see a way that it wouldn't be one that wasn't also relatively high in protein, because I think like that, that is going to be the, 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 the part of it that allows that to kind of happen. So if, I don't think that person would be kind of like the 82, 18 split or the 90, 10 split. I think they'd be closer to what you're doing, Sean, like, 70, 30 or 60, 40, even, uh, then the only thing left on the table is like the event itself, which would be where I think things get interesting because like gluconeogenesis occurring between sessions, that makes a lot of sense to me, but gluconeogenesis occurring during the event itself to make up for the glycogen depletion. That's where I see the gap being in that. And that kind of just goes back to what we were talking about before where, uh, you know, when is the right time to bring in a little bit of carbohydrate and what is the distance and the intensity that that would be required at. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment. Yeah. And I'll just add in that there are, if you kind of could do the experiments and what, what amino acids could you take during training mm. or during the event itself, because certain amino acids are going to have different reactions in the body to others. And so there could be potential that having some certain amino acids during the race could, uh, benefit some of those, you know, energy pathways in the body as well. Yeah. I mean, we've also got, you know, lactate recycling and, and things like that going on, you know, in real time. So we have to, you know, kind of, I guess, account somewhat for that. And, I, and you have to wonder about the absorption, you know, of an amino acid and how long it takes to, to actually get into uh, the bloodstream to be broken down, you know, through the, through the gastrointestinal tract. We know some of the, one of the problems with the sugary drinks is, you know, why you can rapidly absorb, you know, the sucrose and the glucose and the stuff they put in there. But sometimes you get a lot of GI discomfort with that. And a lot of people, that's one of their complaints is they, you know, because they have to rely on the gastrointestinal system and they end up nauseous or throwing up or, you know, having all kinds of you know, diarrhea in the middle of the race and stuff like that. So, you know, again, I don't have much experience with the endurance sports, but that's just yeah. what I've seen reported. But it's really funny that people, that is the major problem that people have in an Ironman event is that they they got GI distress and they were no longer able to eat or drink anything. And then they're vomiting and diarrhea. That is the most common problem in Ironman. And yet everybody still approaches the Ironman as, okay, how do I put more into my gut in training so that my gut can get used to it? And therefore I'm going to limit my chances of that happening in the race, which is the high risk approach rather mm -hmm. than how do I just have less in training so that I'm more fat adapted and eat a low carb diet the other, you know, rest of the time that I'm not exercising. And therefore I'm never going to a bonk. You're never going to have that point where your blood sugars have been up and down for like, you know, eight to 14 hours or so. And then your body just becomes so exhausted of chasing its own tail with increase in blood sugars and then dropping again. Um, and then you're bonking because your body just kind of gives up and can't take it in. Um, as well as having that GI distress. So there's so many risk factors and yet people are still trying to go, no, no, the more we can put in, the faster you'll go. And, and it's like such an obvious argument because you just say, right. So if the winner was the guy that could put in more fuel, wouldn't everybody just be like, okay, that is the goal. How do we put in more sugar in this time frame? Because therefore I'm going to win the race. And it just doesn't work like that. And yet people are still chasing that mindset of the more i can put in the more my stomach can handle and this goes from elite down to you know mm -hmm. the guy that's finishing last still have the same problems and are still chasing the same answer that just uh, doesn't exist yeah there's definitely a margin of diminishing returns when it comes to interactivity fueling and it's likely different like you always hear the 
the antidotes about the folks who can get in like 80 to 90 grams or something like that. And then people think, well, that person did, did great. That must be what I have to do, but it does, you no good if you spend, you know, two hours of a hundred mile race on the side, uh, puking and, and stopping to use the bathroom and stuff like that. So, uh, I mean, that's, you know, I was thinking about that when I was getting ready for the dome race too. It's, I, I find like, I mean, weather plays a huge role even. And I'm sure you see it price probably way worse at Kona than some of these other tri- Ironman at- triathlons, because you, know, you get that heat component too. you know, try shoving down 80 grams of carbohydrate when you're biking through the, the mm. hottest part of that race. <laughs> yeah. I mean the heat factor as well, just that your heart rate is that much higher. The body's under that much more stress. Um, and then that comes back to, again, that perceived, level of safety and and that whole you know central governor theory like if you feel stressed um your body's going to be more stressed you're not going to digest as much um carbohydrate as easily and you are going to have more gut problems and then as well people also fear that i mean i think if you've trained on a lot of carbohydrates and i think this is another theory of mine that's if you are training on a lot of carbohydrates your carbohydrate load you, you were used to having more water in your body, right? Your cells have got more water in them. The carbohydrates is holding water in your body. So I think when you go low carbohydrate as well, your need for water, I think you become accustomed to not needing as much water. And I think it, this is total theory, but you know, I think there's something in it there as well, because I certainly don't feel that I need anywhere near as much water um, in a race when my body's pushing and yeah so that's just something else as well yeah we had a a fellow you know a guy long-term carnivore he's been doing it for i guess 11 years now he's a marathon runner and he runs marathons with no water at all you know Mm -hmm. and he just Mm -hmm. and you know i I guess one of the things and we talked about this a little with tim noakes and one of the things they're finding is because you know you lose a little bit of fluid as you go you actually become lighter you actually become Mm -hmm. you become more efficient because your strength to weight ratio improves and if you can get away with not having to take on that extra water but that does bring up the point of and you mentioned this a little bit about electrolytes and so how do you how do you currently manage electrolytes around training i mean i know personally for me i tend to to do a little salt water prior to 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 working out because i feel like it improves my blood volume which we know there's studies that support it does do you find that that is something that you you utilize or is it something you're not not interested in yeah yeah i've been taking a lot of salt um since i went kind of keto but now carnival um yeah my salt's pretty high so yeah i'll generally start the day it's it's fasted but i'll have like a cup of warm water with some salt and probably like you know up up to like a quarter teaspoon or so um and then throughout the day i'm having a lot of salt as well so something i'm still mucking about with like is the salt making me thirstier during the day um yesterday i kind of did an experiment really i think i had about at least two teaspoons of salt and just to measure like, cause it's not that hot here at the moment. So my normally I might have two teaspoons when it's hot weather and I'm sweating a lot, but I had two teaspoons yesterday and it didn't change my thirst. It didn't change anything else in my body. So I actually think it felt a bit better for it. Um, so yeah, there's still those things, I guess, again, it would be great to have data and, and testing and be able to have, you know, what is going on in my body and um, figure it all out about those levels constantly ongoing. I'm probably due for like some blood tests at some point um, shortly to see what has changed in my body being pure carnival for, for quite a few months um, and mostly carnival for all of this year. So about eight months or so. Um, but yeah, I, I look at that a little bit and that whole balance of magnesium and um, uh, potassium and things. And you might hear one person say, I think I've probably heard conflicting views on your show, probably maybe where one of your guests might've said that, Oh, if you have a lot of sodium, you might throw out your balance of magnesium and potassium and, and minerals. And the, and likewise that you said, if you're having a lot of sodium, then that kind of covers you for your magnesium and potassium aren't really such of a problem. So I'm, I'm, I'm still hearing slightly conflicting views. So that's why I'm still experimenting with how I feel with different levels. 
Yeah, I think we just the, the bottom line is we probably don't honestly know, and so we're still trying to figure that out. And it may and it may differ from like most things. It probably has some nuance and varies from individual for, from individual and and for you know individuals at different times and different activities. So I think that's been the case. Um, well, let me ask you because you said you did keto for a period of time. What was the difference between your like describe your ketogenic diet versus a carnivorous diet and what has been the difference between those two on your either athletic performance or your health? Yeah. So I went keto, let's say most of 2016 and 17, I was pretty keto and really in races, I couldn't really nail down like a good energy level. Um, so everything was a bit flat in training. I was a bit flat and I was always questioning like, why am I feeling the need to pour like half a cup of olive oil over my salad kind of thing. Like I was almost drinking olive oil and that was in that period where most podcasts were all about, you know, fear the protein, you'll, it'll throw you out of ketosis. And they were also telling me that if my ketones were only 0.2, which they generally are all the time, which I now know is quite more, more frequent in people that um, have had a history of athletic background um, are generally going to be lower maybe. So I was chasing ketones with MCT oil and olive oil and um, high, just pure fat, trying to get my ketones bumped up. And a lot of, yeah, salads and vegetables and things. And protein was, I was told to be scared of it and I was having really moderate amounts. And it never felt great, obviously. GI distress was still there. So I've had a lot of GI distress since like early 20s. Um, and that was still there. And so main difference is once I, once I went keto and, and cut out the fiber and, oh, sorry, carnivore and cut out the fiber, that's been the best that my bowels have been like in, you know, 20 years. So that's been one of the best things like to know that I can get out the door and I'm not going to suddenly be like, Oh no, I'm, I'm like need to run to the bushes. So when I was, yeah, a long time ago when I was training in 2011 and 2012, yeah, I'd be stopping in the bushes out for when I'm out for a run because suddenly I'd just have this GI distress and, and need to clear everything out. So not having that distress is um, a huge benefit in training, obviously. Um, and not, I mean, the other big change is that you don't waste food. That's just a, a, a real side note. There's no wastage, is there? The, you know, you're not throwing out stalks of this and that and um, totally off topic, but it comes back to that kind of carbon footprint argument of, you know, the meat that I eat is grass fed and local and nothing's wasted. You know, I'm eating the livers and I'm eating the off cuts and I'm eating all the cheaper cuts that I can get. And, and yet, you know, my, Jamie still eats some vegetables certainly not. Uh, she's not vegan or vegetarian by any stretch. But it's amazing still the waste that occurs when somebody's eating vegetables and you think, oh, well, all that carbon footprint of carrying produce around the country for it to only end up back in landfill, you know, the bits that people don't want to eat in the end of the day. So totally off topic, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's only accounting for the stuff that ends up in your fridge and gets wasted versus how much just ends up not even making it to the, to the grocery store in the first place. You know, yeah. it, gets, it gets to be quite a quite a big like, variable to account for when we're looking at you know how we're supposed to like feed everyone so to speak it's like well i think if, if we have estimates of 40 percent of our finished products getting wasted i feel like that's probably the best spot to start and then yeah. like you said local consumption is probably the second spot to start and eliminate some of that transportation arm and, yeah and i'll go back to the what i mentioned about uh back to my my bowel movements and things and you know, where that's the people that are ringing me up for a consult or that I'm coaching. Um, you know, that's one of the major issues is either constipation and they're, they're having extra fiber because they've been told to have extra fiber for their constipation. And I'm just straight up and up, you know, they were already thinking of carnivore and I'm like, well, if you're already considering it, then we're ready to go there now and mm -hmm. see how that's going to help your bowels. And, you know, and it just does, it just improves everything or every time. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, back on the topic of food wastage, you know, it's kind of funny. You know, I've got uh, 
my girlfriend has a, a sister and her and her husband are vegetarian and they come to visit us and they're, you know, they're great people. I enjoy having them, but they often bring their own food with them because they like to, you know, they like to have all the food. And it's like our, our refrigerator kind of triples in volume and, you know, cabinet space fills up when they bring all the stuff they eat. Cause we, she and I both eat, she eats about 95% carnivore and I'm hundred percent. Our kid eats a little bit, you know, varies in between that. But, um, the trash I have to put out, put out, I mean, it like triples when they're there. It's like, you know, it's, and, and granted there's more people, but I mean, it's just like the volume of waste mm. and packaging and that produce that gets thrown out. And I mean, it just goes way up when you eat that way. And so, yeah, you're right. A meat-based diet for most people is extremely uh, efficient when it comes to waste, at least from the consumer end, you know, and like I said, there's arguments about what happens prior to, you know, processing and all that stuff but i mean for the most part it's pretty darn efficient let me segue into a different topic because we we kind of you know we kind of got bogged down in the marathon conversation but you know as a as a triathlete as a kona guy i mean i believe there was a guy named i believe his name is dave scott who was like a big time another top level you know iron man kona guy and he has basically come out and saying that he was basically during much of the success of his career was done as, as a low carb type guy I mean, do you think it's unrealistic to say that a low carb athlete or even a carnivorous athlete could could win Kona? No, and I and I hope I can get there to kind of prove that it is possible. Um, look, I know that in like I was saying, endurance training, like I can train at aerobic level all day, every day, and then come to a race and be able to perform well above what pace I've been performing at. And I think that with time, that's only going to improve in, in myself where I'll get faster at math. So my aerobic pace should come down in training with a bit more time and consistency. It should come down to well be below race pace. So let's say race pace for a good sort of 240 marathon is around three minutes, 40 per kilometer. Um, but I should be able to get down to about three 3320 at the same heart rate in training with you know good improved consistent training and health so therefore you know maybe i can get off and run even faster in the marathon and that that would be my goal like i don't want to i'm not going to go back to hawaii if i don't think i can run sub 240 you know my, my previous best is a 241 dave scott ran a, a 241 as well so um Dave Scott, Mark Allen, and this other guy, Patrick Lang, recently. So they're the only guys that have run quicker than me in Hawaii. So I want to go back there having trained my aerobic system and fat burning ability to outlast, you know, at that higher pace, just to be able to outlast. And, and I think that's, that's always been the approach in Kona is the person who slows down last wins. And I think that that's the approach that's needed for winning Hawaii because if you go, most people go out into the marathon and they go pretty hard. They get off the bike and the adrenaline's going and everybody ends up positively splitting the marathon. And it's crazy when you consider that even like an 800 meter track runner will negative split the race. And yet we go into a marathon seven hours, six hours into an event and try and, and we, we're trying to run out hard out of the gates. So it's just crazy. So that whole approach of a high fat diet, aerobic training basically lends itself to pacing yourself really well at the start of the marathon. And then towards the end, that's when you can just go for it. That's when your heart rate, it doesn't matter what your heart rate is and you will be running like, you know, well faster than your average pace and, and hopefully negative split is the goal. So it's not just about a high carb diet. It's then a high fat diet, sorry, low carb diet. It's then about changing the way that you approach the race and pace the race better, fuel it just, just enough, but not too much that you're not shutting down fat burning systems. Um, so everything needs to be combined. As I mentioned before, when you asked, is it possible for an athlete to do any event and, and be world-class? I think it is, but it requires a different approach from training right through to, you know, execution of the race. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because I talked to Zach about his recent hundred mile run, and he said he he basically negative split mm. uh, his last you know bit of that race too, which is pretty impressive. At you know, I mean, I mean, a hundred miles in, I mean, doing that at what what was your were you like a six forty six six forty six mile or something like that? Zach average. The average was like six forty seven and a half, 
But I think the end, I'd have to get the real raw data, but I was definitely getting down to like maybe a 620 mile for a couple of those at the very end. So it was uh, the, the easiest way to look at it, I think, is the first 50 miles was 540.38 and the second 50 was 538 and some change. So I was like two minutes and three seconds faster the second 50. I've got, I've got a really good question for you, Zach, around sure. central governor theory and uh, around, so what, what, what was holding you back from running faster? Because then you went on and ran uh, up to 12 hours and got the 12 hour record as well, mm-hmm. didn't you? So at what point do you kind of just go, okay, I'm just going to try and run flat out or what was holding you back from running flat out, I guess. From running like a 5:30 mile at the end or something like that. Yeah, or even in the last, you know, the last five miles, trying to just go abs- go five thirty mile for the last five miles. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think. I mean, it's probably a lot of mental, like, and then I don't know how much physical, but five miles out, I'm maybe still thinking like, don't screw this up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, at least to a degree, anyway. I mean, I was pretty confident at that point, but. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell, like, cause like, it's one of those things where in the moment I probably felt like I was redlining it. Um, but I think you can probably, I mean, unless you drop dead at, right as you finish, you probably left something in the tank and that's just the reality of the whole situation. Well, that's the central governor theory. Right. That makes us all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why aren't you dropping dead? <laughs> right. Well, and it would be interesting if I can find myself in a similar situation down the road to now knowing kind of what I know about this last event, if I can't throttle down a little harder at that point, just knowing like, okay, I didn't die doing it that time. So why would I not this time? <laughs> yeah, Zach, I just wonder, like I said, in retrospect, you know, you're like, okay, now I, you could say, well, maybe I could have afforded to, you know, picked up a little bit here and there. I mean, what do you think you left, left in the tank having done that 1119? Do you think, you think you had 1115 in you that day or what do you think was, uh, I mean, you know, assuming you still had to avoid the same amount of people and stuff, mm-hmm. not talking about going around sure. people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, I think I can get more time off. I think what it'll take is a few more minutes faster that first 50 miles. So just get myself in a position where like I can get through 50 and like 535, 533 and have that feel like it taxed me the same way as the 540 did for this one. And then if that happens, then I should be able to kind of replicate that. And then I'm getting down into that, you know, low 11 hour and potentially under 11 hour time, time frame. So it'll, it'll be interesting. I think maybe just a little more focused training on this. I mean, it seems silly to say that because I have spent a lot of focus training over the years on it, but this specific training block was about as tight as I could have imagined and having it turn out the way it did. So I don't think I found my ceiling yet. Uh, is it, which is, is it just muscular? Is it like muscular aches and fatigue? Like, do you ache where your legs are feel like they're shattered and you can't actually operate them in, anymore if you go out harder? Is that what you fear would happen? Or to, what's to your a degree, feeling? Yeah, to a degree. That's kind of how it felt in 2015 when I did have a little quicker splits early on. I came to put in perspective, I split 100K in 7.03 at this event in 2015, I split hundred K and 658, but 2015, I gave back a ton at the end. I was going like 7:30 pace the last like 15, 20 miles versus, you know, 6:30 almost this last one. But, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, some of it, it's, it's kind of a balance cause you kind of get to like 20, 30 miles in and there's like a certain level of just like tightness and achiness that doesn't necessarily get a whole lot worse but you're just sitting there all day kind of mentally managing that or mentally kind of trying to find ways to pretend that that's not there. So I, 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 I'm, I'm firmly in the camp that this is like a huge mental milestone to break through, to get down further more so than a physical one. Um, But I do think there's maybe some physical things that, that I could do to just stave that off or normalize that a little bit, or at least, give that similar feeling at a faster pace. Hey Pete, what do you have up on the schedule? I mean, are you, are you still actively looking at races now? And I mean, I I assume, I don't know what your time frame is to get back to Kona assuming you get there. Is that something Mm -hmm. we'd look at in 2021 or what, what is your, what is your 
short-term goal. And I mean, you said you're 30, would you say 37, 38? Yeah. Are you too old to win Kona? I mean, I don't even, I don't know enough yeah. about it to say <laughs> how old you got to be, who the winners are now. What's the story on that? Yeah. I know guys have won it um, in the early forties. So there's certainly no limit. Um, and I think it, if, if approaching it with this kind of aerobic training system, which isn't taxing the body, because obviously when you're younger, you can kind of train harder. So with a different approach, um, I do believe it's possible to get back there and win it if everything goes well. But I think I'm actively racing now. I've got a couple of several, well, I've got about four 70.3 races. So half Ironmans coming up in the next few months and then potentially looking at doing an Ironman next year. But I think Kona, as you suggested, it's kind of the years that you need in training of consistency to build up to that kind of Olympic or world championship level. And so I think next year might be still a build up. And then, yeah, maybe 2021 would be like my cutoff. If, it, if it's not happening at 2021, then it's, you know, not going to happen. And next year, even like that, I need to be competing in Ironman and winning an Ironman next year to kind of be like, okay, that we're, we're definitely able to get the training done and the body's holding together um, for what I need to do. But like I said, with, without the aches and pains, it makes it a lot easier. I've just got to get that last little bit of gut inflammation out so that I'm not experiencing any of the kind of brain fog and that little bit of that little bit of inflammation that's still around. So um, I'll just keep fixing up, you know, the histamine diet and um, trying to find any other factors that could be affecting something. But um, yeah, definitely believe that it's possibility to, to go back there and win it on a, on a low carb diet and a, and a carnivore diet. Like I say, I'm, I'm happy now without carbohydrates, but you know, I would be interested at some point with consistency and training to be like, Oh, well maybe, maybe a little bit of honey here and there just as a tiny bit of um, tiny bit of energy uh, in terms of a, while I'm training, uh, keep those blood sugars around five rather than let them dip low all the time just to keep them a little bit more stable um, would be just, you know, interesting. Because I know I would still be fat burning. I would still be metabolically super healthy, but it would just be that tiny bit of support to keep them just around, you know, a healthy base level of blood sugar levels. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, we've had, I don't know if you're familiar with Owen Franks. I don't know if you pay much attention to the rugby, but he's one of the New Zealand All Blacks who would be a thorn in the Australian side. But I mean, yeah. anyway, he's, he's one of the top in the world. And he's, he's been on the carnivore diet now, I think coming in on two years. And I think he's, you know, I think there's, I think he probably adds a little bit of other stuff in there from time to time, but basically his base is 90 plus percent carnivore. And, you know, I mean, he may be the, I think if I, I think he may be, if he, if he gets to the world cup and the all blacks win it this year, uh, he may be the only person ever to win three three World Cups as a, as a rugby player, and so that would be a pretty neat thing. And then we had Sarah Thackrion, who's a world jiu jitsu champion, that uh, has uh, you know also done this as a pure carnivore. So it'd be interesting to see more and more top level athletes, you know, reach his accomplishment. Yeah. Like I said, I've done my stuff on a rowing machine, and you know, that's it's hard for most people to to, to sort of relate to what that is, but it's it's still I think you can do it. And so I hope, I, I hope yeah. you have good luck with that. It'll be good to see, uh, see what you do. Yeah. Thanks very much. It's been, I mean, you've been kind of the inspiration and catalyst for a lot of my thinking. Like, hang on. How is he going at this high intensity threshold effort on a rowing machine and not eating carbohydrates? Cause everybody still keeps saying like, you know, you need carbohydrates to do a high intensity effort, but, I guess it wasn't until I kind of looked into my own blood sugar levels during a high intensity effort that I realized, Oh, well they're, they're bumping themselves up and you're not going to run out of glycogen stores in such a short amount of time from your muscles anyway. So um, yeah, now, now that it makes it's, it's just kind of common sense once you start to see the big picture and that's what the last kind of three years have been. It's been an, a learning experience of how to see the body in the big picture and not get bogged down in these little things that people tell you really matter. Um, and just see the, the body as one big, big, uh, complex machine. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's not that you, you know, you need glucose to do the high intensity efforts. And it's not like, it's not like you don't have glucose. We have plenty of ability to make, make our own glucose. And that's what I've been saying for a long time now. And I think 
the, the point becomes at what point, at what intensity, at what time duration does your capacity to either utilize stored glycogen and then, and then as Zach pointed out, maybe we don't have the gluconeogenic uh, capacity. Maybe we don't have the, the lactate uh, recycling capacity and we exceed that at some point. But where that is, I don't know, because it seems like we've got, you know, people on the endurance world running marathons, there's people on the or ultra marathons, weightlifters, rugby players. And so somewhere, I mean, there may be just a, a, a very small subset of people that have to have uh, mm -hmm. you know, a higher carbohydrate approach to do that. But I think we're finding yeah. that as more and more athletes do this and more and more long-term studies come out. And I know you talked about some of the studies like Louise Burke did the, the three week race walk study. And there's been a number of these three, four weeks trials where they look at mm -hmm. ketogenic athletes. And first thing I would say is one, they haven't adapted long enough Two, I think a higher protein approach probably buffers them more towards being more able to do gluconeogenic type uh, business. And so it's, it's interesting to see, you know, the definition gets narrower and narrower as to what you need for, for carbs. And, and yeah. maybe at one point we're like, well, maybe only certain specialists need them and, and lots of people can do without it. And the question becomes, are they a net positive or net negative with regard to oxidative stress, injury, aches and pains, GI distress, mm -hmm. the gamut, and then what goes into athletic performance over time. And we may find that, you know, athletes eating a, meat-based diet or a low-carb diet or a high-fat diet ultimately do better long-term over their career. So that's, that's, that's kind of the thing. Well, yeah, think, and just, I was just mentioned, like, as you said, those, the research isn't even there. Like the studies weren't around like a real low-carb athlete that's been doing it for years. Um, they're not testing so many other factors of like, hang on, what, how, what was the level of their muscle glycogen when they actually started to feel fatigue? Um, could we have just made them go better with stimulants of ketone esters or caffeine or anything else? Like, so there's so many variables of what was causing these athletes to slow down. Was it just their brain's perception of a slightly lower blood sugar level that caused their muscles to slow down? Or was their glycogen stores at a certain level when they slowed down? I mean, there's so many variables that I'd love to see a study that actually covered like, all of those different variables on an athlete that was on many, many athletes that were really um, fat adapted to like an extreme level, like myself and Zach and you. So uh, I, I'd just be fat. Hopefully one day that all happens. Yeah. I think too, like what you said, Sean is interesting. Like, let's say we did identify a sliver of the athletic world where for whatever reason, you need a higher carb diet to do it. Well, then we just identified the sliver of the athletic world that is probably not good for your health. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, like, I mean, and the marathon may be it. Like, you know, it's one of those things where like, I mean, if you're out there just running a marathon for fun and, and not just going all out, you're, it's probably a net win from health standpoint. But if you're trying to do a marathon as fast as you possibly can and doing that year in and year, year out, uh, I don't necessarily think that that is an ideal position for the, a human to be putting themselves in. I think we're, that is kind of that gray area of like, what is, our, what is the actual biological purpose of this specific activity? And it's like, when would we need to run marathon pace for a marathon to the, to the level where when you get there, you're about ready to pass out? So it's kind of that, again, that margin of diminishing return type of thing where it's like, could carbohydrates be useful to get you to that? Yes. But is it good for yourself long-term? Maybe not. Yeah, I don't, and I don't know. There may be some longevity stats on marathon runners. I can't remember. I know that. And I know they look at certain other athletes and it's kind of, I think athletes in general, do well overall i mean mm -hmm. even football players it's been a misnomer i mean i mean even even like top level bodybuilders you know they they actually live the life expectancy and many times longer and so but i'm not sure on the endurance athletes what the numbers show so i think i mean see. i think they're they're a lot they're, they 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 age a lot better but i think like it's also like what segment of that population are we looking at are we looking at the folks who are running marathons for fun and to stay in shape? Or are we looking at a population of people who are, you know, trying to do it as a, as a job more or less where they're kind of going to that, trying to find that last 1% versus kind of settling in at 90 to 95% of their max capabilities. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with that is you get, you know, it's such a small population. So, mm-hmm. so you can look at Olympic Olympic marathon runners and look at their life life expectancy. But then you've got to realize these people are freaks in yeah. many, many aspects of their life. So there's a lot of confounders in there. And then we compare them to the general population, which is probably doing a whole host of bad things where if they would actually, you know, do the healthy moves then maybe they would outlive anyway. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> well, Pete, I've got to go yeah. pick up my, my son. Um, <laughs> it has been a wonderful and interesting pleasure to talk with you and I wish you the best. Can you let people know how to follow you, find you so on and so forth? Yeah, just Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, all of that's just Pete J. Jacobs, so an extra J, um, so at Pete J. Jacobs. And uh, we have our business that's health and performance coaching, so we'll do try coaching, but also just helping people that are um, trying to just improve their basically metabolic syndrome type symptoms. Um, And that's Live Your Own Fit. That's our website and Instagram, Live Your Own Fit. Um, So that's a business that my wife Jamie and I have um, started up and it's, it's really great to be able to help people with what I've learned and what I've been through and, you know, never going to stop learning, but it's um, great that yeah, at the point that I'm at now, I understand enough that I'm, I'm able to help these, these people that want to either achieve their goals or just in, in sport competitively or just, you know, be able to feel healthier and not feel like they're waking up with aches and pains every day. So you know, thanks very much to you, Sean, for um, inspiration and Zach for inspiration as well. Like totally different ends of the spectrum, but I, I get um, motivation from both from what both of you are doing in your athletic um, area. So, you know, you know, really thanks for having me on. It's been great chatting. Yeah, likewise. It's a, an honor to have you on the show and we'll, we'll link all those uh, handles and websites to the show notes so the listeners can click through. But always have a, have a good start to your day, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Nice and early. The sun's up now. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Pete. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you. Hey, folks. Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing. And due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.